I think we're there. Uh, oh, yeah. 7 10 p.m. Oh, yeah. That was Monday. Oh. Business. Down, though. Public hearing, uh, proposed disposal system, 25 timely extension. Uh, well, profit. I don't see him. I don't see Mr. Profit. Uh, for the owners, Donald and Roberta Cabo. Not present. There he is. There is Mr. Profit. The timing is perfect. Come on in, sit down. Hooked on the cord here. Oh, yeah. That's going to be happy, huh? Oh, God, don't do that for you. This lot is in an area that's subject to severe erosion and wave, wave action. And uh, there's currently a uh, cesspool that's caved in out in this area in here. And we're proposing to replace that with a 2,000 gallon uh, tight tank and alarm system. Um, there's currently, and there will be, uh, two bedrooms in the existing lot. It's elevated. So the water can actually water the house. <clears throat> and uh, it's my understanding now that these utility poles are no longer there anymore. So I guess uh, until power is restored, uh, if, if anybody's going to use it, they're going to have to uh, have a generator. Okay. There's storage above the, from the time the alarm goes off for about four days. And between five and six days of uh, maximum 220 gallons usage uh, to bring it up from empty to um, the point where the alarm goes in. Why, why can't you put that up by then? It's going it just get washed out. Yeah, the, uh, the contours here, just heading right up, but this is actually in the, in the berm of the beach. Yeah, this last storm they lost the poles apparently. That's what Jennifer said. Yeah, they all went over. I was down there the other day. <clears throat> I think the access now, this road is only on Yeah, that's road. gone. They've got a gravel driveway on this side now. Is this their property line here? Uh, no, it drives down here and goes over here. This sliver here is part of um, the next lot down. Oh, I got you. So it follows out like this, comes up yeah. and in like this? Right. <clears throat> And the variance we're asking for is uh, proximity to the property line. The code requires 10 feet, and we're asking for relief to one foot. Um, basically, this is the furthest I can get it away from the water. Yeah. <coughs> nobody's going to live there either. Right, understood, understood, but that makes a problem because then it won't function right the way it's supposed to without the electricity, so it's kind of not before the horse or vice versa. I mean, it's what they got. We could condition the approval on, on the fact that nobody will live there. Well, or if there's no power supply. Yes. Right, yeah, to power supply. Right. Yeah. yeah, we have no problem with that. Okay, um, I move to approve the variance requested for 25 townway extension from uh, uh, the setback from 10 foot to 1 foot of the septic tank to the property line and also condition the approval um, uh, that, that it will not be uh, permitted until um, 
there is electricity or storage for property. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. seconds on the official time on the <laughs> Thank you. 
All right. 7.20 p.m. Situate wind turbine discussion <coughs> continued. Uh, before we get started, I think uh, <coughs> board members would like to address the All right. Um, since the last hearing, a resident raised a question as to whether I have a conflict of interest in this case. And I've gone through uh, a consultation with town council as well as um, the Massachusetts Commission on Ethics uh, with respect to the subject um, and have filed a disclosure in accordance with the, the Massachusetts general laws that applies to this type of situation with the uh, uh, Board of Selectmen, which is the appointing authority for the Board of Health. Um, but I did want to let everybody know the process that I went through so for two reasons. One, to save you a trip of having to go down and bother uh, Kim down in the Swackman's office. And two, uh, in case I missed anything or somebody thinks that I'm not analyzing uh, the situation correctly, uh, I'd rather hear from it because it, there is a conflict. Um, I don't want that to become an issue in, in this matter. Um, and if, I think that there is an actual legitimate con conflict, I would, I'm sure any member of the board would refuse himself. So the issue was that my law firm, which is uh, called Keegan Whirlman, uh, is a law firm in Boston. Um, there's really two or three different departments to the firm. One of them is the energy department. The other one's the litigation department. I'm in the litigation department. In the energy department, um, one of my partners represents Cape Wind um, and has represented Cape Wind for a number of years with respect to permitting the uh, windmills and turbines that are proposed for and, and actually now look like they're going to be constructed in the Antarctic sand. Um, that really was the essence of the conflict as I understood it. And um, if you look at the statute, the statute requires or, or says that there's a conflict of interest or maybe an appearance. If someone has a financial interest or um, if someone that they know or is close to, and I would include my law firm in that, um, would uh, receive a financial benefit um, as a result of any action that uh, the board member would be taking. And um, uh, also uh, a conflict may exist if um, some person would uh, influence that board member's decision um, unduly. Um, from everything I can tell and from everything I've analyzed, uh, Cape Wind and Situate Wind are completely unrelated companies owned by different people. Um, uh, have, they have no common ownership interests as, as far as I was able to tell. Uh, the Cape Wind um, permitting process, I'm sure most of you have read about it in the newspaper, uh, really didn't have anything to do with noise. It had more to do with uh, siting out, out in, in the Antarctic Sound and, and a whole bunch of other issues. I'm not going to say there weren't any issues there. There were a lot of issues, um, uh, but, but not um, the type of issues that were in this case. I'm not sure it would make a difference if the issues were the same, but, but there's no financial interest as far as I can tell or, or commonality. There's no uh, similarity in terms of the issues that are being presented. I'm not aware of anyone who would uh, influence me and my decision uh, as a board member here, I don't even know the Cape Wind people, and I never did any work for, for the Cape Wind client, um, and, and don't plan on doing any uh, in the future. So um, I just wanted everybody to know that since the question was raised. Uh, I've examined the issue. I don't see a conflict of interest. But if somebody does or thinks that I'm missing something, um, don't be shy. Now's the time to, you know, to let me know. And, and I am not offended either by anybody raising this. Uh, question. I mean, I think we, we all want to make sure that this is a uh, fair and impartial process that we go through, and hopefully if that's the case, then we'll, we'll, we'll get to the right decision. So does anybody got any questions for me on that on that issue? Yes? Yeah, David Darden, we're trying to do some on. I'm not sure they totally understand this now. Um, your firm has a client, Big Win. Correct. They give money to your firm. Correct. Your apartment. Sure. You get a piece of that. You get some of it. Uh, I, I agree that I, in some way, indirectly financially benefit from Cape Wind being a client, correct? If I were Cape Wind and I saw you sitting on a board like this and you were to vote 
when I thought the way that I didn't want you to vote, I might take my business away from you. So how, do you, how would you feel about that? Uh, I don't, I don't feel like Capeland would want to do that. Okay. What if they asked you? What if they came to you and said, uh, we really don't want to see you uh, saying anything positive uh, for the residents of Central? Uh, they haven't done that. Um, you know, and that's why I said I explored the issue of common ownership and, and, uh, and common relationships, if, if any. The issues aren't the same. Um, they're just like any, any other company. Um, okay, for the time being, I'll trust you the man you were. Okay, well, I appreciate we'll, that. We'll, I mean, see I, where, we'll see where all this leads to. Okay. If anybody, if people have a serious concern, I don't see the conflict, frankly. Um, you know, there's a lot of commonality in the world, in the world, and, and it, it didn't occur to me, frankly, <laughs> until somebody even raised the issue. But, well, if you've been awake all summer long as I have, and you detected any sense of any little bit of impropriety, you might mm -hmm. be concerned. I hope you understand. I understood. I, I, it's a serious matter, and that's why I'm, I'm disclosing it. Okay. Are there any other <clears throat> comments, questions, or anything in, in regards? <coughs> Seeing none, I think we'll move on, and you're comfortable sitting right where you are, so I'm comfortable with that as well. Thank you. Okay. We'll uh, continue on. Uh, next on line is Gordon Dean, Palmer Capital, Situate Wing, to discuss feasibility of the intermittent operation of the wind turbine in response to a request made by the Board of Health. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, <coughs> next up, would you like I can talk, talk about from here or wherever you want to do it? Whatever yeah, convenient for you. Whatever. Yes. I did print out copies for you, and they're still sitting in the printer at the office. So. <laughs> Fair enough. You're in there before. <laughs> My thanks to Mr. Thompson for letting me use his projector since the town doesn't seem to be working. So. All right. My pleasure to uh, fill in where the town falls short. Of this President of Palmer Management, which is the manager of Citroën Wind LLC. Uh, I appreciate uh, coming back to Citroën Board of Health to try to address their questions. The uh, agenda uh, item talked about uh, my, responsing, my responding to the uh, town's request for, for curtailment uh, options, and uh, I did want to cover a couple of other areas that we discussed last week if the board will allow me. Is that all right? Yeah. No, please. Um, so, uh, one of the things uh, we did since the last meeting uh, was I got a, uh, a, uh, a list of the uh, complaints, the copies of the complaints. Um, we have also looked at what our, our power production has, has been at nighttime. Uh, we looked at our contracts. We've looked at the, analyzed the cost of curtailment, and we've actually gone out and uh, because this was an issue uh, at the last board meeting, we talked about what the cost would be for an additional sound study. So I'd like to co cover those areas. The complaint forms that we received from the Board of Health, um, which we received uh, shortly after the last uh, Board of Health meeting, uh, we compiled those. They come from 13 households. Uh, we have subsequently asked uh, the Board of Health a couple times if they received additional health forms uh, we have not received any additional health forms, so we're just working with what we were given after the last meeting. Um, so we have 13 households in situate who have uh, filed uh, the complaint forms. Uh, three of them, uh, three households filled out more than one complaint. 
The closest household is the complaint was 700, approximately 700 feet away, adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant. The next closest one is 2,900 feet away, and the farthest household is about 3,600 feet away. There, uh, there was also a petition submitted to the Board of Health, uh, which had three additional signatures on it. difficult to see here. <laughs> um, the the foot, first footnote is uh, initial complaints filed with the town of Citruit that have been shared with Citruit Wind LLC. Citruit Wind has requested any additional complaints but has not been notified of any to date. The second footnote uh, talks about the distance as distance measured by Google Maps as the crow flies. <laughs> Um, so we mapped out uh, where these complaints have come from, the households, uh, and uh, there was also a discussion last time of what the uh, wind directions are. Uh, we have over here what's called a wind rose. You can see most of Could you most turn the lights off, please? Can we dim the lights? Thank you. Most of the, most of the households who have complained are to the west of the turbine. Uh, this is a wind rose talking about the frequency of, of the wind from different directions. You'll see that these households to the west. Actually, um, you mean I think to the, the east. To the east, I'm sorry. The wind is from the west. Uh, they'll be getting a, a westerly wind approximately 15% uh, of the time. Uh, the, the, uh, about approximately 18% of the time, the wind will be coming from the south, southwest, when going up that direction. And this well, what period of time are we talking about? Is this when? Over the over the course of a year. <clears throat> okay. So that would um, give you some idea of when the extent these people are having having an impact. Um, it'll be primarily when the wind is coming from the west to the east, um, and, uh, which is approximately 15 percent of the time. And then this is just uh, the wind speed. You can see that. Uh, the, uh, the wind speed is fairly well distributed no matter where it's coming from. Um, we have a fairly good wind regime here, which is why Citra wanted to build it. Can we ask a question? Window. Mr. Dean, I don't see my house up there, and I must have 35 complaints. I don't see 122 Gilson Road back up on there. Um, we were just working on the oh, ones no, that were given to us by the Board of Health. Yeah, I gave a sheet, a printed sheet, with dates, direction, and, and wind. Uh, I don't think I made out one of the, the uh, forms. Um, I mean, your, your house is, is marked it? from where Google Maps said it was, so we didn't go and stay at everyone's house. And you type in the address in Google <coughs> Maps and it tells us where approximately where, you know, where the houses are. Okay. So are these complaint forms or emails? This is whatever the Board of Health gave us. We asked for all the complaints they received. Can you be specific? Were they complaint forms or were they emails from, from people? Because I sent an email too, but I, I didn't fill out a specific form. Right. We sent an Excuse me. We let Mr. Dean um, do his presentation. I don't want to get it too muddled up. If you take notes, please, so I can. Can I just ask one question on that slide? If we're going to stop at every one, it's going to be a long um, night. It's not a long question. Yeah. Mr. Dean, can you explain to me why that Windrose pattern looks dramatically different than the one that was presented in the feasibility study? Absolutely. Uh, I'm not familiar with the one you're talking about in the feasibility study. It was, uh, uh, it was the feasibility study commissioned by the town of Sedgwick that empowered you to construct this wind turbine. Uh, I don't have that with me and I can't okay, comment on it. We can come back to it, but I'll give you a copy. I appreciate that. Thank you. Please continue. Of the, the 13 households uh, that, we, again, that we had received forms on from, from the town, 11 of those had complained about sound. Two of them had complained about flicker. Um, and this was, again, a form that had been, these are the options on that form. Um, the one uh, complained about pressure, and three said they had other problems. Um, and then we copied out some of the uh, comments. Uh, we had several, a couple of people at least, who complained about the uh, light on top, uh, which is an FAA-required light. Um, there's not much we could do about that. It's, 
FAA requires lights on, on tall structures, including windmills, communication towers. So again, uh, the, um, at the last uh, Board of Health meeting, we were asked to look at what is our nighttime power production. And we looked at the uh, hours between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. That's eight hours a day, approximately one third of the uh, of the time. Um, not knowing, you know, exactly what that was going to be one third of the power. We did two things. We uh, we looked at what we've actually produced during those hours from the time we went online back in March, and that was 34 percent of the power we produced. We also went back to uh, the model uh, that was done for the project, that one said that you would be approximately 31% of the power being produced during that time. So we're, you know, with one third of the hours you're not operating, about one third of the power you're not gonna be producing. It's not that the wind will be a lot uh, weaker during the, uh, the uh, evening hours and uh, you would have uh, less production. The, uh, on an annual basis, uh, on, a, what's, on an average case, we expect to produce around 4,300 megawatt hours. If we were to be curtailed from the 34 or 31% uh, amounts from these, uh, uh, during these hours, 11 p.m. to 7 p.m., we would be producing approximately 2,900 megawatt hours per year. So we looked at how does, how does a curtailment fit with our agreements. Um, we have agreements with the town, a lease and a power purchase agreement. We have a couple of loan agreements, including a, a qualified energy conservation bond issued by uh, uh, Mass Development. And we have a record agreement for sale of the renewable energy certificates. The town agreement, the lease, um, says the town uh, will not um, affect the rights that were granted to us under the lease. They will protect those rights. Uh, we don't know whether if there was a curtailment order issued by the town, uh, whether there would be a, a case against the town for violating its, its own terms of the lease. Uh, in the power purchase agreement, uh, we are obligated, Citroën Wind is obligated to produce at least 3,000 megawatt hours a year or is subject to penalty payments. And uh, as I said, if we were curtailed, a third of the time, we'd be, do, be producing about 2,900 megawatt hours. So, uh, we'd be putting us in default with the town to uh, reduce operations. Um, we'd probably, I'm sure we'd be in default under our loan agreements. We'd have significantly reduced income. We're not operating a third of the time. It would be considered what's called a material adverse change. Um, we have certain debt service coverage ratios that we would not be able to meet. In fact, from our modeling, if we would reduce to 2,900 megawatt hours a year, uh, we wouldn't be, even be able to pay the debt. Um, in our rec agreement, for the, again, for the renewable energy certificates, we had projected 4,300 megawatt hours in that contract. The curtailment means we'd be 1,400 megawatt hours short. It's, we're, we haven't asked our council to get involved in this at this stage, but I'm not sure what the legal ramifications would be to be underproducing. Um, clearly, the person who entered into a 10-year uh, contract to buy the Rex uh, would be a little disappointed that we weren't producing. What would it cost? Well, if we're not operating a third of the time, we're going to lose basically a third of our income. Uh, we could make that up. Uh, by the town coming back to us and increasing what it pays us under the power purchase agreement. We'd have to go from uh, 8.9 cents to 14.8 cents, 66% increase. It's, the town would no longer be realizing any savings from this project. In fact, it would be incurring excess costs for the power. It would have approximately $230,000 uh, annual negative impact on the town's budget. We, um, because it was a discussion of a sound study, we went to two consulting firms we've dealt with, uh, Atlantic Design and, and Tech Environmental, asked them to give us a, uh, a quick um, estimate of what it would cost 
again, this was this was prepared for the for the board of health meeting that got postponed. So there wasn't a lot of time between the two meetings. Uh, we have a uh, one-page proposal, outline proposal from Atlantic Design and Modeling Specialties for approximately ten thousand dollars, and from Tech Environmental for thirteen to sixteen thousand dollars. I did bring copies of those, which I can give to the board. And uh, I think that addresses the questions that uh, you folks asked me to address, and then some. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Happy to take questions from the board. I'm done for the evening, aren't I? No. <laughs> when you say you have the proposals, do you have them here now? Or? Yes. Any questions from the audience? Well, it's the lights on, but yeah. <laughs> Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Travis, and I'm an attorney representing um, Mark and Lauren Keeper, who live at 151 Driftway. Um, I just wanted some clarification um, as, as to the nature of the complaints that were requested um, by Situate Win of the town, if it was in actuality a public records request or if it was a request for general complaints, because it doesn't seem clear to me that all of those complaints were accessible to you in your review, in your review of them. Um, um, I, I emailed, I believe I emailed the, uh, uh, the Board of Health um, and asked them if they could give us a copy of all the complaints that they had received and any materials they had received um, on this matter. They sent us a list of, of what they had, uh, including, you know, other people's comments. Um, but one aspect of that was a set of forms filled out uh, with health complaints. Uh, that was emailed to us, and that's what we analyzed. Thank you. But on that, could you get us a list of all of the points, the addresses that you had on that um, slide? Certainly, yes. I think that would help us answer the question whether they were all covered. Mm -hmm. Sure, sir. Chairman Palmer Soli, 37 on that These complaints, these 13 complaints, are they sim just since the last meeting? or the total number of complaints received by the Board of Health since um, this matter started arose? These complaints were given to us shortly after the last Board of Health meeting that we attended. Um, as I said, I have asked a couple of times if any additional complaints have come in and I have not received a response. So I can't answer for the Board of Health. So I think it's 13 complaints since the last meeting. I'm almost getting a feel and I'm not sure, but it might be 13 complaints after the last meeting and it wasn't since the complaints. At the, time, at the time of the last meeting. Right. That's right. what I'm yes. guessing. But the gal, the answer to that, I, she's not here. She's on vacation. So it kind of... I think that's what I'm, I'm getting. It also sounds like forms. Name, please. Patty Shea, yep. 37 Laswell. It also sounds like, because they are, you either send in a form or you can just send an email. And we just sent an email, and it sounds like other people have done that. So if you just count the forms, I would think that would be a small. Yeah, no, we know there's more complaints. That, that, that what he had, I would, we understand there's a discrepancy there. So. I, I um, thought it said 13 yeah. households, not 13 complaints. I, I said 13 households. Yeah. Correct. addresses is what you're talking about. And 11 of those were about sound, two were about quicker, and one was about pressure change? Yes. And there might have been multiple complaints, I'm assuming. Yeah, so we indicated, we indicated in the earlier slide that the three households had filed more than one complaint. So I'm confused. How did Excuse you me. take the yeah, third? Oh, I'm sorry. Hey. Oh, I, I was just trying to understand the breakdown, that's all. All right. David Darty, 122 Gilson Road. So I'm confused. You have complaints, multiple complaints from 13 households. 
That's correct. Yeah, we have multiple complaints from three households. We have a total of 13 households who had complaints that have been provided to us by the Board of Health. Do you have the total number of complaints, some total? I don't have a top of my head, no. So you're taking all that information, this is what I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, and you're looking at that and evaluating it from those homes, which direction the wind was, was blowing to cause all those complaints, correct? We were looking at, based upon the population of houses that are out there, uh, what houses have complained, where are they located, um, to see if that would provide us any information on in the impact. And from that you extrapolated what direction the wind should be blowing and at what times of the day and night when you would have to shut it down to eliminate those complaints. Is that what that number is based upon when you came up with losing the $220,000 and 13,000 kilowatt hours or whatever it is? How did you come up with those numbers? We were asked to evaluate curtailment at nighttime, and we picked we picked a time period from the left. Yes. Nighttime. Nighttime. Yes. Nighttime. yes. Yeah. That's what so we asked them to do last time. Okay. Right. Okay. So those were the numbers. Okay. So why did you choose to point out the people that evidently had comments that seemed to be uh, uh, distasteful to you, rather than bringing down a sheet of the con of the comments about? what the direction the wind was from and the headaches and the dizziness and why did you only make the comments about the things that seemed to be making a mockery of us in your presentation? Why didn't you also cite the number of headaches, ringing ears? I think the point was made. We're going to carry on. Um, sure, please. Mr. Chairman, my name is Jerry Kelly and I live at 56 Moreland Road. And I am one of the complainants and I do live <coughs> east of your uh, wind turbine. Um, I've got a copy of the feasibility study here for Situate, and I can also dig through my bag and pull out Cohasset, both of which served as the basis of your proposal uh, to Situate and to Cohasset, that have the wind row, uh, rows based upon studies here, and it looks nothing like that wind rows. Could you please explain to me what the, what the, uh, uh, what the difference is here? You can see right here, that two-thirds of the time the wind is blowing from the northwest to southwest. It is not equally distributed. And I can pull out the cohesive one from my bag and show it to you also. I cannot comment on that study. It's not, it's not the one that we did. So I have a but was the basis upon your proposal? <clears throat> if, you didn't, if you didn't bid upon this feasibility study, then I think that we probably should have nulled the contract. I'm not going to go there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Alex Alvarez, 53 Collier Road. Um, so when he presented this slide, he um, said 15% of the time from the west. Yes. Kind of saying it's that if you look at where the houses are, the wind from the northwest or southwest will also affect those houses, right? So um, when you look at that wind rose thing, if you look how much from some parameter from southwest through northwest, it's much higher, at least visually, than 15%. So I just wanted to, you know, it seemed like that 15% was probably not an accurate statement for the amount of time that a problem could be caused. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? I think you just took your thunder. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Fair enough. Um, one more in the back. Yes. Yeah, at Joe and East 62 Collier Road. I also live east of the Turbine. And I have a question uh, for Mr. Dean. In one of your slides, you suggested, I think you suggested that if there's an additional, there would be a cost associated with a sound analysis study beyond this. There was discussion at the last Board of Health meeting about the town doing its own study or asking Department of Environmental Protection to do a study. Yeah. And there was a discussion of cost. As a courtesy to the town, I went out and asked a couple of consultants we work with what might be the cost of that study just to bring the information back to the town. Okay. But isn't it true 
in the special permit that, that was um, that, that you folks in the town agreed to, if there's reasonable doubt that that the turbine doesn't meet the sound requirements or the sound standards specifically for the town of Sitchinwood, that the town would have asked you to do a sound analysis. Uh, hey. That's, I don't believe that's a, a condition of the special permit. I have it here if you want to see it. If you'd like to read it. Yeah, that, I can provide you yeah, no, that's that's fine. There is an uh, article in the in the special permit. That Correct. Yeah. That's okay. Brought so to the if, if attention by, by the planning board. Okay. Yeah. So I just asked that question. Yeah. So if the town does feel that in this reasonable doubt that it doesn't meet the standards, that's right. Then the town of Situate ought not to um, bear the burden of that cost of the study. Uh, Situate wind ought to. Am I correct? I, I believe you are. I, I do, because we've been doing some discovery, as I said, since this came up, and that was something that we had found and working to. Okay. Oh. Yeah. We'll address that in a little bit. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. So just so I'm clear, though, you're, you have it in front of you? Well, I have. I just have the one page out of that about that. that and you, you, you read the paragraph. It's paragraph 10 on uh, right. page okay. 6. So you want to make sure we're talking <coughs> about Is that accurate? Paragraph. Well, that's what I'm reading, too. Okay, oh, okay. And, and I would suggest that uh, the building inspector, Neil, uh, would also have to... Uh, I read that, too. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, Same thing. Same paragraph. I'm going to go one more on this, um, okay. please. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tanya Travison again from the McKeevers. Um, so members of the board, as a matter of clarification, um, the numbers that Mr. Dean gave with respect to the number of complaints, I just wanted to clarify that the McKeevers alone have sent in 71 separate emails of complaints to the board. Yeah, no, I think, okay. I think we understand there's some sort of miss something there that no, we, we <coughs> okay. yeah, the first meeting address that I think clearly absolutely absolutely one more one oh, sure one. yeah so um, I was a little concerned that the health issue was being tied to a potential financial impact to the town yeah and I, I just want to yeah. also point out that there would also be the financial impact to the town of the property values in that whole neighborhood yeah. dropping, right? Which might be bigger than that number. Yeah, well, that's a health issue here. It's not a financial issue, so no, that's understood. Just one other thing, please. Jerry Kelly, 56 Moreland Road. We heard a lot tonight about potential lawsuits and uh, cost to the town, but isn't, isn't there the fundamental requirement of this to comply with the mass DEP noise policy that states that sound of uh, sound is a type of air pollution that results from sounds that cause a nuisance. We're trying to address uh, mass DEP and the health effects, not the financial effects upon the Understood. investors just of, said that. of yeah. Palmer Capital. Understood. Understood. Thank you for bringing that up again. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, Tom Thompson, 149 Gilson Road, to address <laughs> residents and water health members on health acoustical analysis and communications <laughs> issues. I'm right behind you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're just uh, having a cooperative cable here. Thank you, Mr. Are you going to be uh, shooting the same way? Yes, I'm just going to. Uh, when we're ready, we'll call you the back. When we're ready, when we're ready. <laughs> One more right. One more right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. We don't need to. Uh, we let's uh, let's put the lights down just for a moment, and then we'll we'll leave this on. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Tom Thompson. Uh, I reside at 149 Giltson Road in Situate, and I'm honored. First of all, I want to thank the Board of uh, Health for allowing us to have some standing here this evening uh, at tonight's meeting. Um, and I'm honored to represent the citizens and neighbors and family members that have been directly impacted by the negative health impacts since the commissioning of this industrial wind turbine back in March of 20, uh, 2012. 
I've pointed this out already on a couple of occasions. I've done so in media interviews. I've done this online and offline. But I think it's an important point that we point out that there is nobody, nobody that I've talked to that is a neighbor of mine that's been impacted about this that has a negative position against renewable energy in principle. We're actually here because we're for something. And we're here for the responsible siting of green energy installations in proximity to residential neighborhoods. We believe, however, that the location of the industrial wind turbine in Situate, Massachusetts is an improperly and incorrectly sited location for an industrial wind turbine. I was going to mention that uh, there have been uh, additional uh, information items filed to the Board of Health by neighbors and residents and family members of mine around the negative health impacts. We've already discussed that ad nauseum. We're, I think we're pretty clear that the numbers are probably much greater than, than referenced here uh, this evening. So, But it is clear that the issues around sleep deprivation and shadow flicker resulting from this industrial wind turbine continue and they are profound. I very much appreciate Mr. Dean responding to the Board of Health uh, request for some comments around the impacts uh, for a reduced runtime on the industrial wind turbine. But we are here at the Board of Health to discuss the health and safety issues around this, not the health and safety impacts to the balance sheet of Palmer Capital or the wind developer as a result of a discontinuation of this industrial wind turbine. I think it's also important to point out, generally speaking, that given the impacts on the families in our neighborhood, certain members of this group have spent an awful lot of time reviewing permits, planning processes, data, studies, etc. And it's pretty clear that there have been significant deficiencies in the overall, overall approval process that have led up to the commissioning of this thing, and more importantly, the impacts that folks are um, experiencing uh, as a result uh, a result of this. In addition to the complaint forms and the emails that the Board of Health has received, there's two recent reports and studies that have uh, been introduced that speak directly to the issues around improper siting of industrial wind turbines in close proximity to residential neighborhoods. One dated July of 2012 was introduced by Dr. Christopher Hanning over in the UK. His focus was on wind turbine noise, sleep, and health. And for the record, uh, I just received a copy of this report and did forward it on to Jennifer Sullivan's assistant here at the Board of Health to share with members of the Board of Health. In fairness to them, they probably only would have received a copy of this in the last day or so, so I doubt if they've had an opportunity to review this. However, it is, there are two general conclusions that are extremely important uh, cited in Dr. Hanning's uh, report. The first one is, is that there's no published experimental evidence that wind turbines are safe with respect to sleep disturbance and health at distances and noise, noise levels deemed unacceptable in Dr. Hanning's report. In contrast, there is clear evidence that those receptors, those would be people, living within 1.5 kilometers of the proposed turbines, they had significant risk of disturbance to their sleep and consequently effects on their health. And in the conclusion section of this report, Dr. Hanning goes on to say that in his professional opinion, anything closer than 1.5 kilometers of a residence is an improperly sited industrial wind turbine. I also just was shared earlier, uh, or yesterday I should say, with another uh, study that was uh, published in the September-October issue of Noise and Health, which I haven't had an opportunity to share with members of the Board of the Health, but will do tomorrow. Uh, and this, as I understand it, is the first of its kind to be scientifically vetted and approved through the peer review process, which is an extremely incredible, incredible and important process in terms of scientific analysis. And the concerns raised in that report are consistent with Dr. Hanning's findings regarding the impacts to human health 
uh, in close proximity to industrial wind turbines. Now from a practical matter, what you're looking at right now is video footage of the McKeever residence, a family that has children who are neighbors of mine and live approximately 600 feet from this improperly sited industrial wind turbine. It's my understanding that this video was taken the same days that the McKeevers were attempting to hold a birthday party for their daughter. And you can imagine the impacts on friends and family and loved ones that were visiting that house on that particular day, but more importantly, the impacts on the McKeevers on a day-to-day -day basis because I understand it that as we sit here today, the McKeevers are impacted for approximately two hours per day with the shadow flickers such as it is this time of year. And anybody that spent any time reviewing or analyzing the permits behind the industrial wind turbine application knows that those hours of shadow flicker go well, well beyond anything cited in any of the documentation leading up to approval of this industrial wind turbine. So why are we here? We're here because we are before the Board of Health which is a duly constituted body responsible for protecting the health and safety of the residents of the town of Situate. This industrial wind turbine was commissioned and operational in March of 2012. For a few months, people experienced this sort of impacts along with noise quietly and personally until they had an opportunity to individually and collectively speak with neighbors and friends and family and it only became apparent as we moved into the summer that this was not an individual impact this was an, a community impact and this is why the Board of Health started to receive the emails and the complaint forms and the calls of concern in the late summer and early uh, autumn of this year begging pleading for some protection from the negative Im health impacts such as you are seeing here this evening. This is our third appearance before the Board of Health. I've had the pleasure of being at two of them. Mr. David Darty, who is our leader and champion on this, spoke before you uh, the first one and will also add some comments later on this evening. During the last Board of Health meeting, we delivered a message to the Board of Health respectfully that we felt that a decision be rendered and it would be appropriate and timely for a decision to be rendered to discontinue the operation of this industrial wind turbine completely by November 15th, 2012, which is one day from now. We believe that the information cited by friends and family and colleagues and neighbors who sit here before me and before the Board of Health out of concern plus the scientific evidence that is clearly starting to uh, be put out in the public domain, discussing and citing and pointing to the issues above, leave no uncertainty as to the impacts such as they are to the neighbors. And this is clearly a decision that the Board of Health has the ability to make and rightly should make. And I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, otherwise, I'd be more than happy to pass uh, the gavel, if you will, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Darty. Sure. Uh, turn the line up. Thank you. No questions. No question. Any questions from the, uh, from the audience? Please. Uh, what time of day is this? It's about 1.30 in the afternoon. From 1.30 to 3. RMP, about 1.51. Jerry Kelly, 56 Moreland Road. I, I really don't know how the town of Situate finalized their wind turbine ordinance. Uh, but the draft that was suggested on... Is this a question related to what was... Yeah. Okay. On September 16, 2010, in section 16, spot 7, spot 3, stated that shadow flicker shall not exceed 10 hours per year. You know, this doesn't seem to be 10 hours per year. This is over 10 hours per week. 
um, a follow-up to that question. Is this from March of last year that you get this shadow number? Sorry, this is the Bravo Google. Um, or is this a certain season? This started Mark McKee of 151 Driftway. You know, you all are looking at this and you have no idea <clears throat> how difficult it is. We can't go in any one of my rooms. We either have to go to the basement or we have to get out of the house. It, 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 I'm so furious and so irritated by this. What am I supposed to do? What, what do you do? I have, to, I have to leave my house from 1.30 to 3.30 every day at sunny out? That's wrong. That is wrong. Everything about it is wrong. And I don't know what's going to come out of this, but I am a prisoner and I can't, I, I'm, I'm tied to this house. I can't go anywhere. And just on that note, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Thank you for ruining my daughter's birthday, her seventh birthday. I appreciate it. Please. Um, Julie Burgess, 10 Rental Ave. Um, it's heartbreaking to listen to the McKeevers, who I just met through this whole process. My family and I were out on a beautiful Sunday, this past Sunday, out to the spit. We were out there for a good two to three hours. And my daughter, who was 11, said, look at that shadow over there. What's that? She didn't even realize this huge shadow. You could see it from the spit, this giant shadow going around. And the McKeever's house is sitting right in that shadow. I mean, it's clear from that distance what those people are going through. And when you watch this video, I made my daughters sit down and watch this video because I said, even though we can sleep, our neighbors can't. And you know what? She made me turn off the video. She said, I can't watch that because it was making her anxious. Move on. Next item, David Darty of 122 Gilson Road to address group. David Darty, 122 Gilson Road. First of all, I want to thank the board for allowing me to speak again. I have already heard you once, but I have got other information to give. And I want to apologize to begin with to Mr. Dean because I may say some things in here he may take personally, but I don't mean them personally. I have a wind turbine that's kept me awake all summer long, made me feel ill, and I have to go after something, and you just have to be part on. So I do apologize, sir. I'm sure you don't mean anything. I really don't mean to hurt people. You, but you have a lot of money at stake, and I can understand you protecting yourself. Uh, this business, and I, I wasn't here at the last board of health meeting, but I got a video from the town, and I played it over so many times that I almost feel like I was here. And before I get into the real nitty gritty of my discussion tonight about siting criteria and compliance codes and you know, the DDP and how the wind reports that were su submitted to the town uh, are all faulty. I want to say a few things about that meeting that I missed. This business about self-inflicted health issues, that somehow my problems are my imagination because I heard something or read something, I feel like that Sokolov uh, law thing. If you know of or heard of or somebody who may have known of, you have a problem. Well, that, that's not the case. That's nonsense. I never heard about wind turbines going into Massachusetts or anywhere near me. I was away with family issues for a number of years. I came back and there it was. And it's hard to miss. It's 400 feet high. But I thought, you know, okay, so it's there. Two nights later, whoosh, 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 and it goes on from there. I was woken. I didn't get on the internet and try and find out what this is doing to me. I didn't realize later that I started getting tired and sleep deprived and getting headaches that was from that. I tried to find out more about it and I wanted to contact the DEP and I didn't know how to do that and I read an article in the paper. Or my fiance had cut out an article in the paper in the Globe about an editorial about the turbines. And I said, oh, maybe this person who wrote this article and editor knows something about the DDP and how we get in touch with them. I called them, next thing you know, they're up for an interview. And then I started getting emails from people. My neighbors started saying, hey, 
we get the same problem. We didn't know. We, we thought it was just us. And that's where we went from. So this self-inflicted stuff in, that we learned about it, we learned the hard way. As far as shadow flicker goes, you've seen on the video the Makibas, and you've heard the number of hours that it's taking place at their home. And that far exceeds the 10 hours that, that uh, the reports that Mr. Deans and, and the city of Wind LLC had said. But in the last Board of Health meeting, Mr. Dean was said on that, that shadow flicker is negligible after a thousand meters. Well, Mr. Thompson and his wife Michelle Banning live at 149 Gilson Road. They're 3,300 feet from it, and that's a little bit over 1,000 meters. And they have shadow flicker, and they have submitted videos of it to the Board of Health, and you have that. So that's another flaw in what we've been told by the owner and operator and of Situate Wind LLC. Two areas right there that are non-compliant. And we saw tonight what I was afraid of. I was going to bring up, I didn't realize that Mr. Dean would have his PowerPoint presentation and show the, how he evaluated the complaints that were given to him by the Citroen Report of Health. I thought I was going to have to make note of the ones at Fairhaven, where he said, I guess it was a 12-page letter that I submitted to the Board of Health a month or so ago, where these good, honest people, hardworking people in Fairhaven, who can't sleep and they work during the day and they have these problems, try and put down their comments and try and determine what direction the wind is from and, and what speed. And they're not trained in this. They're lay people. They're not an engineer or land surveyor like myself. And his people, his engineers, sat down and criticized and found comments in between that to discredit each of them. And he showed it right here tonight. Instead of putting down on the comments where he had, this one didn't like the lights, he never once put any listing in there of how many headaches there were, how many people had lost of sleep. He only shows the parts of it to discredit us. I find that quite annoying. And he says he wants to help you people resolve. Well, that's not help. He's just trying to protect his own position. Now, there's been a lot of talk about compliance with the DDP. And we all know that there's one thing that you can only make them comply to on any of these windmills, wind turbines are up, and that's the DEP uh, CMR 7, 310 CMR 7.10. that deals specifically with, with noise and when noise becomes pollution. There are three wind study reports on file with the town of Situ. There are two that are compiled by Atlantic Design engineers for a wood situate wind LLC. And they're a part of the special permit that was granted by the planning board on April 25th, 2010. The other report is done by Tech Environmental in 2008. I thought that that was done for the town and Massachusetts <coughs> Technology Collaborative, but I didn't realize that they were connected with Mr. Dean because Mr. Dean asked them for a price impact to do testing, so we must be somehow connected with them. But in any case, their report is also on file with the, with the town, the planning board. All three of these reports state that Situ is a rural community. And they confirm this with the fact of either a chart or a diagram. And that ambient background for rural community is usually considered 30 dBA by that chart and also by three or four others that I have that can give to the Board of Health from across the country that show rural communities and that ambient background level is usually around 30 dBA. And in the tech, massive, in the tech environmental, one of the findings they had, one of the uh, noise, the L90 as they call it, which is the recorded noise 90% of the time, the, ambient background level at nighttime when it's the quiet is 29 dBA. And in the Atlantic Tech, the Atlantic uh, design, they have a 30.4 as their level. They agreed with 
So all of this agrees with the fact that low ambient in a rural community like Situate is around 30 dBA. Now again, their permit says that they have to make compliance to DEP 310 CMR 7110 that states, and this is a quote, if the source increases the broadband sound level by more than 10 dBA above, I would say above ambient, they know that word above is really special, they're not calling for a combined value of the ambient source, source of noise. If you look at the sound studies that are done, they're incorrectly calculated. They combine them in a logarithmic uh, <coughs> equation. And it's sort of like taking the mantissa and the two scales, like this, here's the ambient in the background, and here's the noise from the, from the uh, turbine. And you project the line up in the middle, and it comes up, comes up to a different value. What the DEP is saying is that you take the background, the low ambient background, then you take the noise from the turbine and you subtract that low ambient, which is usually around 30. And if that difference was left over is greater than 10 dBA, you're in violation. And this is confirmed because this is the way the, D, the DEP did the testing for noncompliance in Falmouth, where they shut it down. They went out there and they tested the ambient. They shut the, they had them shut the, the turbine down. They tested the ambient background. They got that level, the L90 level. Then they had to turn them on, and they took the levels. They call it the L50 level, which is the level that you get 50% of the time. That's how DEP wants to do it. And they subtracted the low from that, and they got greater than 10 dBA. They said, shut it down. So the way that those reports have been done aren't the way that's done. And it seems to be the status quo for any design engineers that are working with the wind industry. They, if they can get away with it and misinterpret the DEP regulations, they will for their benefit. There's a lot of money to be made. Another contributing factor is the misrepresentation of the wind shear factor. Now, the difference in wind speed is not factored into the calculations. In New England, New England is known for its high wind shear effect. The report uses wind shear factor 1.5 rather than the normally accepted maximum value of 4. What wind shear is, is that the winds at the top of the uh, mast, at the top of the blade, 400 feet in the air, are greater than the speed of the ground. And this occurs a lot in New England. We get higher aloft speeds and, and, and lower speeds. Some people come up claim it's a part of the stable condition that exists at night when you get a uh, an inversion of temperature between the warm air being the bottom and the cold air being up top and it flips around at night because the heat leaves the ground and the cold air comes down and then you have a stable condition where there's no friction between the levels so the air at the top can flow higher but there's a lot of speculation but the fact remains is the phenomenon exists that in New England you can get speeds four times the value up top as you can down the bottom they use 1.5 which is not really considered the norm through New England. So that means on a quiet night now, when you have a low ambient background noise, or like L, the L90, 90% of the time. Let's say you find it at 30 dBA, which they have found, and supposed to be. And there could be no wind or little wind at all, and you could have design speed winds at the top of the turbine. And the turbine going crazy. I woke up a few nights to the noise of the swish, swish, swish. And I said, there's no wind. I thought I was imagining things. And I didn't put it down on my, on my sheet because I, I feel like a fool. You know, I said, how am I going to say this thing's waking me up and making noise when there's no wind? But that's the situation where there's no wind at a lower level, but there's wind up top. So what this means is, is that you could have almost no wind down below, which would relate to a, a quiet ambient background, like 30 dBA, because there's no wind to, to, to put any background on. But aloft at 400 feet, there's enough wind and turbulence to drive that 
turbine at its operating speed of whether it be three or six meters per second. And by the way, Paul, you asked about the conversion. Uh, 2.3 multiplied meters per second by 2.3 gives you miles per hour. So that thing could be turning at its optimum, putting out the most noise that it can, but yet they're taking it, they're not using that value because they say, oh, it's 30 dBA, there's no noise, because they make the calculations based upon the wind speed, but there's a big difference in that now. So those calculations are incorrect. So it's necessary, what's necessary is to make the calculation by subtracting the low value, the 30 dBA, from the maximum noise that the wind turbine could produce at any distance you're evaluating. Now this condition doesn't happen all the time. But it does happen. Infrequently, but it does happen. Maybe, who knows, once or twice a week, once a month, doesn't matter. It happened on Monday night. I thought I was, I thought I was incorrect because I, went to, I could hear it from the window shut. Actually, new windows last year. Um, I, I lifted it up and I said, I can't believe I can hear that thing. And there was no wind at all. That's I looked at that. the trees because I thought I was going crazy. I had no rustling of the leaves, nothing. And that was making a huge, huge noise. But there's nothing in the DEP, re DEP regulations that specifies how often non-compliance has to happen. I mean, this is an extreme case to say this. And it happens an awful lot with us. But even if it happened once, that's enough to make it non-compliant. But it happens all the time. And the way they do the calculations, they don't take this into concern. And when this happens, well, and all wind, and wind studies have been done in error. The wind turbine could be shut down on this point alone. And I haven't touched upon the accuracy of the manufacturer's noise specifications yet. When the manufacturer, like Cinnabon, makes their turbines and they sell them, they tell the developer how noisy that turbine is going to be under different operating conditions. And they have this, I guess it's like a graph, you know, like you throw a rock in the water and the ripples go out. And they tell them, at, uh, at the base, it's going to be this noisy operation, at full operation, at maximum speed. At 100 meters, it's going to be this noisy, this noisy. And they show a digressing amount of time uh, of noise going out for distance from the mast. How they come up with that, I don't know. But they do it on a uniform surface. They don't take into effect trees, hills, valleys and water. And everybody in this room knows that if you stand on a beach with the onshore wind blowing in your face, and you see some boats out there, you can hear everything those guys are saying, even the morning service guys. <laughs> so the same thing's true with the wind turbine. So you can have a condition, particularly we have that. We got the water going across the North River right over to Moreland and over to Collier Road. You can have a condition where there's little or no wind blow, with the wind blowing across the marsh with wind shear, and this noise even carrying even further across the water, and it's affecting people all the way down to Collier Road. The, Al the uh, Alvarez is here going, going down, right down the street. This, this is not an uncommon situation. It's happened everywhere where there's a wind turbine. I think Jerry Kelly brought that up a few times. He talked the last meeting about how he was saying it's a condition when the tide is high and it's just water. We're having that right now. Yeah. You had it when you did the acoustic study on February 18th to 22nd, 2008. That was a high tide. There was not a noise sensor put on the other side of the water, though. Now, I want to discuss the inadequacies of the DEP regulations because Right now, there's enough in those regulations with the conditions we have to show that this turbine is not in compliance. But the DEP regulations were written in the 1970s. <coughs> and then they were amended in February 1st of 1990. And they were written mostly for the interstate highway system that came in, noise from trucks and cars, things they never experienced back in the 60s and went into the 70s. But they never imagined 
industrial sized wind turbines at the time, or figured all of the factors, the noise factors that came into them. Wind turbines are a special entity unto themselves, as some of the reasons I've explained. The wind shear, uh, and another factor I'm going to get into right now, called aerodynamic amplitude modulation. Now, when you have a wind turbine that stands that high, and you have wind shear, where you have higher wind velocities than the top and wind velocities than the bottom. For some reason, when that blade comes down, it makes a noise. Whoosh. And that's what is caused by aerodynamic amplitude modulation. But the key thing about it is, it goes usually once every second. Whoosh. Whoosh. Because there are three blades. And if you time the number of revolutions, it comes out that way. One second. When the DEP says that you're supposed to take noise samples, they say to use the L50. And when the L50 is done, you miss the spikes that occur with the whoosh that are graphic. I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. You can see that the top spikes there that go up to 46 dBA, those things are all of the whoosh, 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 the one second. Whereas the L50, which is usually somewhere down the middle of the noise level, it's like around 40 dB right in there. That's what they measure the noise on, the L50. So if they were taking a measurement, and this is the, this is the, this is the, the Falmer uh, wind turbine, they would take the ambient low, which is L90, the quiet noise that you hear every 90% of the time. Then they turn the turbine off and they take the L50. As you can see, if you run across looking for the, if you run across the L, around the, the middle of the graph, right through here, about 40 decibels, that's what they would record for the L50 or for the noise level. But the spikes that they knock out, because they don't occur all the time, they don't want to have those in there. Those go all the way up to 46. You can see there's an additional 6 dB. Or if you had the normal ambient background level of 30 dBA, you've got a 30 from 46, that's 16 dBA. Now, the current DEB, the DEP regulations don't take into account dynamic, aerodynamic amplitude modulation. But there is hope on the, on, on the scale for this because aerodynamic amplitude modulation is be beginning to be understood and accepted. The town of Bourne has adopted wind health regulations where they not only do they reduce the ambient sound level that's required above the ambient load, it's usually 10 dBA by the DEP, but they reduce it to 6 dBA, and they actually identify and define aerodynamic amplitude modulation. This is boring. And they set a level of 4 dBA between the troughs and the spikes. They see it. And I don't know what's going to come of it. I'm hoping something positive, and it's just not a sham or a, uh, some sort of a show, but that RFP that's out on the street from the CEC and the DEP actually asks them to look and test for infrasound, those sounds that, that A-weighted sound samples don't go after, and they're looking for dynamic amplitude modulation. They're asking for all this stuff. So I don't know what they're going to do with it, but they're going to find it. And I'm hoping that the DEP will be as forthwith coming with this as the town of Bourne. So you can see, this is an area where these things don't comply. But the wind industry gets away with it because the look of the DEP regulations don't even recognize it as yet, but hopefully someday. Uh, 
I wanted to, and as far as, uh, I didn't know if I was really going to show you this, but there was a, I have an advisory letter here that was uh, written by Ambrose and Rand, who are two acousticians who are pretty well known in the field. They're the ones that did the McPherson report, found out that they got sick and everything, and they, they do a lot of reports. These guys are board certified and schooled, and I guess Ambrose worked for Stone and Webster for 18 years before he went on his own. Uh, the wind industry will say that they're uh, wind wise people and everything, but the thing is they're very truthful. They wrote an advisory letter uh, in regards to the, the Madigan wind turbine acoustical study that was done in, in Nantucket, and that the turbine has been voted out. Uh, they had a town meeting, and by unanimous hand uh, uh, vote, they said they didn't want it. They have one small one, but this was a, a major one. And uh, they analyzed the wind turbine report, which was done by Atlantic Design Engineering, same guys that worked for Mr. Dean. And they say in their executive summary, I'll give you this, and I only have one copy. It would fail to meet the Code of Massachusetts Regulations 310 section 7.10 as noise levels will exceed the noise limits by more than 10 dBA above a naturally occurring quiet hour background sound. It's obviously that, that they looked at the <coughs> these regulations as they're supposed to look at them and not how Atlantic Design did by adding the two cumulatively and coming up to a logarithmic progression rather than looking at the low end of the background and subtracting from the highest one. The optimistic pre-development results provided by Atlantic Design, originally finding were found to be faulty based on data analysis in nine areas. I won't go over the nine, there's just a couple I want to say in there. Atlantic Design did not use the quietest measured sound levels required by DDP. They did that again like they did in Situate. They measured low ambient in one place, and then they used higher values in other places. They, they don't want to accept the fact that Situate in the community is a rural community. And if you find 29 dBA in one location, then who cares whether you find 30 somewhere else? Maybe the crickets were loud or whatever. You use the low ambient value. That's what the community is. And they didn't do that. Uh, they didn't have any margin for error. There's a safety margin apparently needed to comply with regulation of the DDP. I didn't know that, but I'm not an acoustician. I'm just a civil engineer, like the engineer who stamped the report for Atlantic Design. He's also civil. He's one of my colleagues. Uh, I don't know anything about acoustics other than what I've been studying lately, but I certainly wouldn't go around and stamp a drawing saying it's certified. Acoustical engineers are trained as acoustics, or they're mechanical engineers with a, a BS and ME with maybe a master's in acoustics. Sybils, we're not in a dirt and concrete. Number six, there's no way to know what sounds contributed to the existing background levels they measured. Compliance with the state regulations require a good understanding of what is measured. Atlantic design calculations were based on unattended sound measurements. They weren't present throughout the recordings. These guys sit there and they watch, and if they get a spike or something, they say, what was that? It was a motorcycle going by, and they scratch it out. They don't let it contribute to the L50 or the L90. But it's an expensive way to go. And then, the last one, this is interesting. Atlantic Design didn't conduct sufficient survey time. Atlantic Design measured only three nights. That's what they did in situ on both their they measured three nights less than the one week stipulated by mass DEP requirements. I didn't know that, but again, I'm not my field. So evidently, uh, <coughs> the proponents of wind power, the developers who make a lot of money from this, uh, know what design engineers to go to who will fudge the books if you want to. And they've been getting away with it a long time. But hopefully this will cease in the future. I'm a skeptic. 
the wind industry talks of complying, but they're only interested in keeping their turbines online. And frankly, if I were in their position, I'd be doing the same thing. I lived in a nice, quiet little neighborhood, didn't have any turbine near me. I was making a lot of money on this, getting all kinds of money from the government and everything. I would do everything I could using these reports the way they are. So when they say they want to help remove these health issues, I don't believe them. The current DEP regulations are insufficient to adequately protect residents from what we have with, met with, with industrial sized wind turbines. They don't belong in residential areas. The noise level is too high, and they make unacceptable compliance standards. That's got to change. Right now, the standards are there for some of the turbines. But the way that the wind studies have been done, they've been twisting them and not looking at them correctly. I have a report here. This one I have two copies of. This just came out. It's out of Noise in Health magazine. And I don't think it's the one that Tom Thompson was talking about, because I don't think this is, unless I don't know what peer uh, analysis is. This was a study that was done by three gentlemen. One, a Dr. Michael Missenbaum, who was a doctor up in Northern Maine, Fort Kent. Dr. Christopher Hannon, who was a doctor of sleep disorder in the UK. And Jeffrey Aramini, who was an epidemiologist from Canada. And what they did is, they looked at Mars Hill, Maine, that's got an array, I guess, of 28. And they looked at, uh, at Von Lionel Haven. And they took 32 people that lived within 1,000 feet of these things. And they sent out a, 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 uh, a nurse practitioner. And she interviewed them to find out specifically what they had for problems, health issues. Unlike the, and, 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 and unlike the DEP, D, the DEP and the Department of Public Health panel of experts <coughs> who looked at paper reviews, these people actually went on the ground. They went out there and they talked to people. And they also took the recorded uh, results of all of the uh, tests after the wind turbines were in there to find that they were not compliant. They took all those, they collated them with the people and the times of their their complaints and issues, and they came up with this report uh, that you have. Study participants were living within, a, I was wrong, 1,500 meters of the nearest turbine. They have here, which is an interesting statement. Remember, these are two MDs and epidemiologists in our own country. The degree of effect of sleep and health from industrial wind turbine noise seems to be greater than that of the other sources of environmental noise, such as road, rail, and aircraft noise. That, of course, is what the original DEP noise criteria was evaluated on, because they didn't know anything about industrial wind turbines. So that's why the, the laws aren't effective anymore and why we've got to do something about it. And their conclusions were, we conclude that the noise emissions of an industrial wind turbine disturb the sleep and cause daytime sleepiness and impaired mental health in residents living within 1.2 kilometers. That's 4,572 feet. I'll verify that. It did it to me. I'm 3,200 feet from it, so even worse. Industrial wind turbine noise is further source of environmental noise with the potential to harm human health. Current regulations seem to be insufficient to adequately protect the human population living close to industrial wind turbines. Our research suggests that the adverse effects are observed at distances even beyond one kilometer. Further research is needed to determine at what distances risks are negligible, <coughs> as well as to better estimate the portion of population suffering from adverse effects at a given distance. You can see that they're trying to show a correlation between poorly, uh, or the inadequate DEP regulations and to what really exists when it comes to wind turbines. I love statistics. I got to give you this one. Seventy-five percent of all industrial wind turbines in the United States 
are cited where the population is less than 100 people per square mile. 99% of all the industrial wind turbines in the U.S. are located in populations less than 500 people per square mile. Massachusetts has got an average population greater than 800 people per square mile. And what does this suggest to you? It's tough when you start getting into densely populated areas to try and cite these things. You're going to have health issues impact. You're going to impact people who live around them. It, we all can't be wrong. One of the best generators of, of issues is the human ear. And if we've got 40 people like we have that have, have complained, that's 80 health receptors, these ears. I have a graph to show you about that. But, and traditionally, historically, the DEP, every time they have investigated an issue with a large number of people, like 30 or 40, they've always found something wrong. You don't get populations of people around you, and I mean groups of people like we have here, 30 and 40 at a time, coming forth if there's not something wrong. We've got to get with it, folks. You wanted the job. You got it. Now do it. Shut it down. Forget about it. You can't look at the financial aspect of it like, like Tom said. We get people that are really hurt by this thing. We get children that can't even sleep and go to school and learn. You know that's going to affect them the rest of their lives. You don't have any recourse. I'm glad I don't have your job, but you got to do it. You got it. Either that or step down and let somebody take the job and do it. I hate to be so mean, but this has gone on too long. I know you're all good people. And you want to do the right thing, but you you might have be apprehensive because of the impact and, and the selectmen and the town and what it's going to mean. But it's got to be done. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Dowd. <clears throat> I, I do have a question. Huh? Please, you, you saw the, the graph about the wind direction and how, not a big surprise to, to most of us, it mostly comes from particular directions and, and a much smaller percentage of time it comes. Uh, it seems to come the opposite direction, from, from the east uh, mm -hmm. directly. Um, what is your experience with the noise when, when the wind is flowing that way? Well, let me, let me back up and tell you, I have some experience with wind roses. We call them wind roses. Before I went into business myself, I worked eight years for the, civil, for the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, I was a design engineer. I went around the road all around the United States. At the end, I was chief of construction for the Federal Aviation Administration for, for all the New England states. I had a lot of dive going on. I had millions of dollars on the contracts going on. We used to do studies of airports, wind roads, where they put a tower up and they would find a which way the direction the wind blows to determine the prevailing winds, and that's where you decide a runway. So we knew that in the cross runways. And if you look at any airport, you see which way it is. Now, your question was, what experience do I have that? The prevailing wind, according to the wind rows that I saw, not this one that Mr. Dean showed, but the one before, was from the southwest. And I agree with that. It's from primarily from the southwest in the spring and the summer, and now it kind of turns around to the, the northwest and the northeast for the winter. Whenever the wind was from the southwest, where I'm located, I'm directly northeast, of it, I, would, I would get noise. Uh, again, when I sensed that there was either no wind or a little bit of wind, so there was like the three meters per second or the seven miles per hour or less, or up to 10 miles per hour, is when I would get the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. I didn't get thumping that sometimes you get with uh, aerodynamic amplitude modulation that I've read about and been told about by, I've spoken to some acousticians, by the way, as you can tell. But I didn't get that, but I got the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh and the spiking. Uh, and then the nights that I had no wind, but I heard it, I said, what, am I out of my mind? But as I'm learning more about this, and frankly, I didn't want to learn this much, but I'm trying to defend my home, and I got a fiancé that loved that house so much. And, but that's what I got from the, from the, directly from the southwest. <clears throat> now, there were times that the wind would be slightly from the south, 
So if you looked at a projection of the wind, it would maybe go by me to the to the east, to the west rather. I didn't get the whoop, 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 whoop so much, but I could hear noise from the turbine. Those same winds aloft that carried the noise of the thump, I would hear the, the like the sound of the jet airplane engine. Well, when the winds like now is right now from the northeast tonight. I, I just came back from Florida. That's why I feel so good. I've been away for a month and no more headaches. And I'm feeling good. I'm getting sleep. I was here last night. Wind was from the northwest. Didn't bother me. Northeast today. You know. But it does turn around to the southwest sometimes during the, during the winter. And it blows from the west a lot, particularly in the summer. And we're spilling from the west the people down in Moreland and, uh, and call you get it the most. I suspect that if somebody were to put a, a sensor down in Marshfield with these winds from the northwest to the northeast, you could get something down there and you get some spiking on your, your AAM. Guaranteed. I'd like to add something to that. It's not just the sound, it's the pressure. Yeah. I have had um, complaints about the pressure in my ears that be in my house with all the windows closed. And it's so, it hurts so bad that I feel like my head's going to explode. I can't, get a, I can't get away from it. It just comes right through. And I can't, I wasn't hearing the turbine. But I was feeling it. Well, that's one issue that I didn't bring up. Uh, that's that infrasound. That, again, I've read about this. And I felt it too, but I, I forgot to bring it up. I'm sorry. That sound under 12 hertz, where you can't hear it. Because it, right now the sighting, the compliance code is A90, which is the A band or A weighted, which means that they don't want to hear the, the non audible sounds. And we don't hear those sounds below 12 hertz, but they're very pressure sensitive. And the wind turbine pushed those out greatly. As a matter of fact, I sent an article to Jennifer Sullivan. And it was years ago, the military experimented with high doses of infrasound with that pressure to try and affect the enemy. And they found it was very, very effective, but it took too long. But in the case where you live in underneath one of these, time is all you got, unless you go to work during the day and go back and forth. But that low pressure sound that you were talking about is there. And the that's another thing I'm gratified to see is because it's actually spoken about in, in, the, in the RFP that's out on the street by the, the Clean Energy Commission and the DDP to test for that. They want them actually to look for that to see what they find. And they also want them to check the terrain, which is another problem, which I said with the modeling effect where the, where the, the manufacturer of the wind, wind turbines give them this flat table-like thing and they want to see what the effects of terrain and water and hills and, and valleys and everything. It, it's a very complex thing, but not complex enough where if they want to actively go after it and do it. But I don't want to digress too much, but you know, those guys in the DUP got a lot of political pressure on their back. They get, they get the governor who wants to push all of these wind turbines. And there's a big, there's a big lobby for these things. There's billions of dollars up. And it's gonna, they're gonna get worse because now that the Democrats are back in, they're gonna continue to give all of these incentives. I mean. It's out of our control. <laughs> well, I know that, but, you know what That's an army, you know, you know what an army <laughs> is? You know what an army C is? It's called a renewable energy credit. For every, if for every one megawatt that a developer puts up, he gets a credit of $1.2 million of tax money. You know, it's a lucrative thing. And I can understand if I were in that business, I'd want to build them and put them in. And as long as the DEP doesn't have the right uh, protection, they'll, they'll put them anywhere they can. Let's stick with the one we got now. OK, yeah. yes, but I'm just, well, I'm worried down the road because if it hadn't been for the misfortune of the people down in Falmouth and Fairhaven and Kingston, you people might not be as, 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 as actively involved in this right now. So by us being active and maybe getting something done, the next guy in the next town won't have this. And maybe they'll cite them properly at least one kilometer 
put, I mean, it's hard to talk like that, at least a mile and a half, 1.25 miles. I'm totally for renewable energy. We need energy. We can't con keep consuming fossil fuel the way we do. We either have to cut down on our energy use or find some other means. But we can't sacrifice people's health. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Any other questions? Good job, sir. No other questions, Mike. Oh, I'd, I'd like to yeah. uh, make some remarks. I don't have prepared remarks. Yeah. May I, please? Sure. We'll make it quick because we're, please, please. Okay, yeah. I'm not going to repeat what was said previously. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Jerry Kelly. Um, I still live at 56 Moore Lane Road. As a matter of fact, I've lived there since 1977. My brother lives a couple of doors down from me. Uh, my dad uh, grew up in East Boston. Um, I guess he likes sound. He was deaf as a hack. He moved down to Westbury, uh, New York, and we thought that the Northern State Parkway was noise. So I moved to Citroën because I wanted peace and quiet. And I had it until February of 2012. I spent um, a good por portion of the, since the, uh, of the time since the last Board of Health meeting reading through all of the document trail for this, both for Citroën and for Cohasset. Um, I'm a supporter of green energy, responsibly cited green energy. If you read the Conserva Conservation Law Foundation, one of the biggest proponents of green energy, they use the term responsibly cited. And it is 1.6 or 1.5 kilometers, pardon me, uh, that they use as a standard. Um, my personal story is, after Hurricane Sandy roared through and we had all the noise and the electricity came back on, it was about 3.30 in the morning. We opened the doors, it was 70 degrees. You know, the winds had abated and I couldn't get back to sleep because what did I hear? The wind turbine. You know, I could sleep through Hurricane Sandy because it, was a, it wasn't a steady sound, but I couldn't sleep through the wind turbine. A couple of comments. Uh, David, uh, or Tom, referenced this uh, wind turbine noise study. And they don't talk about nocebos anywhere in here. But what they do talk about is wind, study, wind studies about the adverse effect of wind turbines upon people's sleep and impairing their health from the British Medical Journal, the Ontario Environmental Review Tribunal, the National Institute of Health, and the World Health Organization. But they don't talk about nocebo at all in here. You know, I don't want to be reduced to idiot fringe uh, because I'm not. As a matter of fact, back in the 80s when there was an investment tax credit for uh, something I was in, Palmer Capital's business, taking the investment tax credit, the maker's depreciation, selling that out to high net worth individuals who wanted to shelter their tax liability and arranging debt to finance it, exactly what Palmer Capital has done. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments here. The special permit uh, in April of 2010 that the planning board was giving to um, Celaya at the time, hosted um, uh, Mr. Shaw from Celaya and um, somebody from uh, Atlantic, what's this? Atlantic Design Engineers. And the planning board expressed concerns about issues about Flickr. And in the uh, minutes of the meeting, it states regarding Flickr, Mr. Shaw said he's not aware of any Flickr complaints. Mr. Tabasinski from Atlantic Design said that he, his office is close to Mass Maritime that has a smaller turbine but is still good size. They've talked to residents who are closer and that the, uh, to that turbine, then any of butter will be there. It's difficult to believe. Um, and there are no issues with Flickr. Uh, I think that we see that there are issues with Flickr. The town was on the right path. In the draft wind turbine ordinance, September 16, 2010, you addressed all of these issues. It was remarkable. You said in 16 spot, 7 spot 2, you set noise levels not to exceed 5 decibels increase over the ambient levels. You were there because their acoustic study came in at 9 for the McKeevers. 
So what happened in the interim? Somebody raised it to 10 so that we, we could install this wind turbine. Shadow flicker, 16 spot, 7 spot, 3 said shadow flicker shall not exceed 10 hours per year. Um, and there shall be pre-application testing of shadow flicker at locations within 2,500 feet of the wind, wind energy facility. I don't think that was done. Um, 16 spot, 7 spot, 5 addressed wildlife and bird migratory uh, patterns, and it said that the applicant shall provide in infrared thermal imaging of bird activities at the proposed siting for a one-year period. What's most remarkable is it, it also said there, and Mr. Dean should know that if they left 16 spot 13 in here, that the applicant or its designee shall maintain a phone number and identify a responsible person for the public to contact with inquiries or complaints throughout the life of the wind energy facility. You had it all. I don't know where it went, but you had it all. Um, going back to uh, David's comments, 32 people may seem to be statistically insignificant. That's a big portion of the population in both Vinyl Haven and Mars Hill, Maine. There are far more potatoes than people up in Mars Hill. Today, you, read it, you probably read an article in the Glob, and it was in the business section about the rise of wind energy. Making David's point, the three installations that they cited were Groton, New Hampshire, population 593, Florida, Massachusetts. Somebody had a demonic sense of humor naming that. That's on the, that's on the um, uh, whatever they call that trail, uh, Route 2. The Mohawk Trail, halfway between Greenfield and Williamstown. <laughs> there are about five people that live there. Um, and Eastbrook, Maine, 40 miles outside of Bangor, east of Bangor. You know, that sounds like the greater metropolitan Bangor area. I've been 40 miles east of Bangor. There's nothing there. That's responsible siting. So I, I implore you folks, I thank you for your time. You could be home suffering through yet another Celtics game at this point. Um, I really appreciate what you've done, and I implore you to hear us. We're not a bunch of nuts. So thank you very much. All set. Um, I had some communication with Jennifer before she left. Uh, she had looked into and we had discussed um, post-construction studies and I, I see what you stated about DEP and you know, that's part of the people we have to work with but uh, we had to look into who's qualified, who's not, where we get funding. I think we did find out that we can get funding with the complaints that we have through Situate LLC. Um, I think you had said that you had the paperwork for it. That's, that was discovered by um, Jennifer uh, as possible funding. And as part of that, I mean, I, I well, the board members here, but I, I, I'd really like to go forward with the post construction study. And in my opinion, it, it's either, and I understand you all are telling me it's causing a complaint, but to have the expert say that it is definite, too much decibels or not. And I don't know to go forward with a committee if, if people are willing to do that, to move forward with post-construction. Um, there was something, like, again, that I say was discussed uh, through Jennifer. And, um, Mr. Chair, may yes. I speak to this point? Sure. Um, I've had some consultation with members of our community on this particular issue, expecting that this would be something that may come up this evening. We would consider an agreement in that respect, understanding that we still are pressing that for a formal decision to turn this thing off twice more. We would consider something along these lines, and I'll caucus with my group again and get back to you twice more. 
but we would have to be part of the selection process. Absolutely. We would be part of the group to um, prepare the scope of work for the RFP around this study. Um, we would have to be in agreement as to who those candidates would be so that we don't have similar instances such as we saw with the approval process here. We would want to see that thing shut off between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. in the uh, 7 p.m. in the evening and 7 a.m. in the morning, so that people are at least not impacted and able to continue their lives and get get their rest until such time as the study was completed. And as part of the RFP process and the agreement between the town and the community, we would also have to agree in advance what the action <coughs> items would be when the results of that study came in. If the Board of Health is prepared to agree to that, then I would be in agreement to discuss this with this community group and try and get an answer back to you by tomorrow. But those would have to be the conditions in which that we would see it. Yeah, I'd have to see, and, and like I say, Jennifer's on vacation, so it, it puts us in a quandary because she's the one that acts for the board. Um, and she pulled a lot of this information together and things. So let me if let me have the conversation with the community group yeah. because I'm speaking as one individual that has a bit of a pulse. And again, I'm speaking as one individual too. I got two others on my side that may so, totally differ from so me. If we could have an agreement and perhaps chat via telephone tomorrow at some point in time at this particular point, sure. then I would be you have my undertaking that we'll have that conversation. Sure. Sure. And and just to say a what was written here again is um, to have a representative from Situate LLC, to have a representative from the Board of Health, and um, probably Jennifer as well, and she was saying at least two citizens of the affected thing. The only thing we do need if more people want to be involved is we need an odd number. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, and, well, well, and the, well, the thing we, we, we look at is worst case scenario, where do we want the studies done? And you know, taking into effect the elevations, the topography, the water, the, the, there's, there's a lot of stuff there. But I think the input from the audience is going to be what it is. But it keeps everybody on board that that we've hired the right consultant to do this, and our consultant with the right acoustical engineer to do this. That that both sides trust, or however it works out. But with at the least there's a common agreement. Uh, and you know, from you know, from my understanding of the agreement. Um, as it is, I mean, certainly this is a cost that should be borne a situate LLC. I'm 99% sure it was written that if there are problems that they would bear that cost. And, I think this and we certainly wouldn't want to see the integrity um, of the, or the content of this report uh, compromised in any way out of concern for budget, understanding that it still has to be a reasonable budget. Mm -hmm. So this will be part of the conversation that we're going to need to have. Yeah, I think we, the, if you pick a number of sites, and again, worst case scenario, and uh, there will be a member of To me, it was either built that it works or built that it wasn't. There, there will be a member of our group I guarantee you that will have the experience and the expertise to provide reasonable input in that respect. Yeah, I think we had a, the first night you presented a pretty good map that showed a, a pretty good layout of, of yeah. the areas. And, and like I say, however, amongst your group, I, I see a, I can picture a few right now in my mind that would be excellent suited for that with the research that's been done. It's, it's impressive. It is. I've um, gotten an education sitting here. What I didn't expect. And, uh, no desire. Uh, no, not at all. No, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure one that runs all our horizons. We weren't expecting to have to spend the time to research. So. Uh, no, uh, I don't think of any of the to be here. Anyway. I didn't like having to fly in from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, please. Yeah, I, uh, just, just to clarify here, I see what Jennifer was suggesting and what I think the board is proposing, and I want to make this clear, is that we will form a committee. Jennifer's idea with, with, with two members of the affected group, Sisha Wynn, herself, and one member of the Board of Health. I see that committee making a recommendation both as to a study and as to a contractor to the Board of Health and then the Board of Health voting on it. So to, it, it's not like, just so you're clear, because sometimes language is difficult, it's not like you're going to decide that. You're going to make a recommendation to the Board. I, I'm sure the Board will 
um, uh, respect the, the work that went into it, but ultimately this decision has to be made by the way of health. It will be a very difficult environment if we don't have the support of the people directly impacted. I understand. Maybe you understand what yeah. I'm saying. Um, but we, but I think, I we think understand we, governance. But we, yes. we need to be clear of the decision-making process here, too. Yeah. No, um, that's all clear. Mr. Kelly also pointed out uh, that, and I read here, too, that the permit seems to uh, implicate the building inspector um, as part of this process as well as the decision maker, which is something that I hadn't considered at all. I read this, the, um, the permit uh, last week. Um, and I think we need to give some consideration to that. I think that the Board of Health can act independently of the building inspector, but clearly the town saw a role uh, of the building inspector as well, and so I think we need to involve that department. So um, from my understanding, you know, Mr. Lynch, right now we are dealing with a Board of Health issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Right? So if there are, were deficiencies, whether it's with the planning department, building department, whatever that is, our issues are based by the health and safety of this constituency that's with me here this evening. So what we're trying to determine is what's the best way to deal with this. Okay. We're not right. here to attack anybody that was involved in the approval process. Oh, no. Okay? No. So, un un there, unfortunately, maybe of time, we don't want to get to that point. We just want to have this thing properly handled by the Board of Health with our participation and input. And let's let's get to a, pay, a place where there's a, a bit more trust involved. So, so if, I, if I could just finish, um, uh, and if I could ask Mr. Dean, uh, I thought I heard you say at the last hearing, um, and I think the permit says, but it's not 100% clear, that since we when we'll fund the study to make sure that it's in compliance, at least with the noise, Specifications. Is that true or not true? If we are asked to, in accordance with the permit requirements, to conduct this study, determine we are in compliance, we will do so. We appreciate, I think I said this at the last board health meeting, that uh, anything we were to do on our own would be considered suspect. I think it's too bad that we have to have people who, you know, they tech environmental was hired by uh, the state to help kind of sits with the fact that we've used them on another project, you know, suddenly their, their credentials are suspect. Uh, you know, I think we need to get beyond that. There are qualified noise consultants out there. Um, and uh, we're happy to work with the town of Sitchwick, with the community, to get a qualified noise consultant to come in to do a study of compliance pursuant to our permits pursuant to Massachusetts noise um, requirements. Um, we are not looking to, do, to fund a witch hunt. I think we've uh, got some regional minds here that want to get this resolved in a, in a good way, and I think if it's all put on the table, I, I think we can get through that. I really do. And Let me ask you one more question. How do we address the flicker question? Should that be part of this study? Absolutely. 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 Oh, no. We have no question. Um, Flickr was analyzed for the permit process. Um, the uh, and that report is part of the file. Um, you're welcome to take a look at that. Um, I don't know um, what. There's no epilepsy, despite. Some people saying there is in some of the health board health uh, comments and there's no epilepsy issue. I don't think that was a question. Um, no. But um, uh, we don't we don't know of a, of a health issue from from a shadow. Okay. Um, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Okay. <laughs> um, so I don't know how you go about evaluating that. I mean I don't. Um, and, and my question is driven is, is driven by this primarily, Absolutely. which is pretty dramatic. And if you if you go down there, you can especially now with the, the light well where you can see shadow for quite a period of time. Um, and um, it seems to me that it needs to be studied somehow. Uh, I recognize that the 
the permit doesn't really address that question. And so I think we need to know whether um, your company will participate in a study of that as well. And I'm not asking, I, I understand that you're just here tonight and so and you may not be in a position to make any of these decisions tonight. Um, but I think we need to know with the Board of Health as to whether we can do a noise study with you and, and, and we, we appreciate that that means you agree to participate as, as we've outlined in that. I think some, some evaluation of the, of the quicker shadow problem also needs to be performed. And um, if, if Situate Wind isn't going to participate in that, then we're going to have to figure out how we're going to go about doing that. Again, we've, we've modeled what the flicker is going to be, as we discussed. Um, you, you, know, you know, when the sun comes up, when it goes down, we're just going to do that. That's what the engineers uh, have evaluated, and that's what the study gives you in terms of where flicker will be, uh, in terms of times of the year, how much. Um, I'm not sure what you're proposing by a flicker study, so I'm confused. Well, there were some representations and some statements made in the permitting process that led up to the approval of this. There was nothing set forth, unfortunately, within the conditions um, with respect to shadow or flicker, but, but I think there was certainly an expectation upon, on the part of the CAM that this was not going to be um, a significant problem for, for any of the, the people in the neighborhood. And given that expectation of, by the members of the CAM and, and what we've seen and what we've heard now over the last three meetings, that that, that expectation may not have been fulfilled, I think it's something that needs to be studied a little bit further to determine exactly how bad it is and whether it, it, it met those expectations or not. That's, that's a, what I'm asking is whether situation, and I'm, again, I'm not saying you have to make this decision tonight, but I think we need to know soon so that we can decide on um, whether we need to fund our own study using other resources. As I said, I, I don't know how you go about <laughs> such a study. Um, go, go okay, well, I'm going to take that as, Come to my house and there's no studies necessary. Spend spend three hours in that flicker and you tell me that you're not gonna get a headache, you're not gonna get dizzy, and you're not gonna you are not going to feel uncomfortable. Just come. You're, come see how my children are. Come come to my home and see how my children have headaches. I have headaches. We do not sleep. This does not go away. We do not get away from this. This is twenty four seven, seven days a week for us. It doesn't matter which way the wind blows. It does not matter. This is my life. It matters. My children matter. Chris, the one we're going to have to work on is, is the flicker study. The feasibility yeah, study and all the documents. Please, please, please. Horrible. Um, Mr. Chairman, question. thank you. I, it's not a question, actually. It's a point of clarification. Um, okay. Before I address the McKeever specific concerns to the board, because I am on the agenda for the evening, and I promise I will be brief because it is getting late. Um, the materials that I submitted for your review, which is to be part of the record of this, me this meeting this evening, includes the special permit, which is attached as Exhibit C. Okay, Paragraph 15 of the special permit explicitly states that the applicant, that situate wind LLC, shall assume the reasonable and customary costs the planning board monitoring for compliance with the special permit only if there is a reasonable basis to conclude that there is a non-compliance with these conditions. So clearly, Situate Wind LLC is responsible for the costs okay. for the compliance issue, to, to clarify. But do you agree with me that there's nothing in the permit that addresses shadow or flicker? We only talked about in paragraph 10. It talks about um, the, the noise issue. Um, well, if you'll allow me, I could give my presentation at this point, and That's I do address some of that, Mr. Chair. Sure, please. Okay, thank you. Um, again, my name is Tanya Trevison. Um, I represent the McKeevers who live at 151 Driftway. Um, their home is 640 feet from the wind turbine. Um, again, as a procedural matter, um, I request that the letter dated today uh, that was hand-delivered uh, to the board and all of the attached exhibits be included in the record of tonight's meeting. Um, first of all, the operation of the wind turbine constitutes a nuisance and is dangerous to the McKeever's health. We've heard several sightings of the different symptoms that have been suffered by 
many of the neighbors here, including the McKeevers. And since the wind turbine became operational in March of 2012, the noise, the vibration, and the flicker created by the wind turbine affected the McKeevers daily routines, their sleep patterns, and their general health. Exhibit A to the materials that I submitted earlier is a number of emails and records that the McKeevers have submitted to the Board of Health since May of 2012 through November 12th. They document how the wind turbine is affecting them on a daily basis. Sleep disturbances, headaches, extreme fatigue, nausea, dizziness, ear pressure and pain, anxiety, and difficulty concentrating at work and school. Additionally included in the letter that I submitted today on the McKeever's behalf is reference to a letter from Dr. Karen Zamel dated October 24th of 2012. Dr. Zamel is the pediatrician of the McKeever's children and has been since their birth. Having examined the McKeever's children following the children's repeated complaints of headaches and difficulty sleeping, Dr. Zamel attests in her letter to the fact that the children had never had these complaints prior to the wind turbine becoming operational. Again, I offered a copy uh, for your in-camera review during this meeting, but I would respectfully request that I be allowed to take that back before the children's privacy um, and it not be included in the public record this evening. I, I don't have a problem with that personally, but I do think you need to put the letter into full context and, and without um, uh, taking a position on the McKeevers, because I'm very sympathetic to, to, to the history that they have laid out here, the doctor also said clearly in this letter that she could not say whether the symptoms were related or not to the, to the turbine, correct? Right? That is true, but they never did suffer the symptoms prior to the operation of the wind turbine, and that's the key. So in continuing, of great concern to the McKeevers is the fact that the Board of Health has been aware of public health concerns related to the wind turbine, even before the wind turbine was constructed. A review of certain public records reveals an email dated January 10th of 2012 from the Director of Public Health, Jennifer Sullivan, stating, quote, I am aware of health concerns as relates to wind turbines. The Situate Turbine is not located in a residential area, per se. A copy of this email is included in the record and is attached to as Exhibit B. Next, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that Situate Wind failed to secure the necessary permits from the Board of Health before constructing the wind turbine. Exhibit C is a copy of the special permit that was issued by the Planning Board on April 9th of 2010. Exhibit D is the site lease agreement, which was executed on January 5th of 2010 between Situate Wind and the town. The terms of the lease agreement are incorporated into the special permit by reference, which is on record at the Plymouth Registry of Deeds. Paragraph 13 of the special permit requires Situate Wind to obtain all necessary permits, including permits, from the Board of Health. That is a direct quote. Can I ask you what permit that would be? That's the special permit. <coughs> oh, you mean the Board what of Health permit? Board of Health I'm getting permit. to that. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, pursuant to General Laws Chapter 111, Section 143, the Board of Health is granted the quasi judicial power to review these types of sites for wind turbines. Okay. It states specifically, quote, no trade or employment which may result in a nuisance or be harmful to the inhabitants, injurious to their estates, or dangerous to the public health, shall be established in a town except in such location as may be assigned by the Board of Health thereof after a public hearing has been held thereon. So situate when, in fact, although they have been claiming that they have all the requisite permits, to put this wind turbine where it is, they do not have the requisite permits <coughs> because they did not come before the board before it was decided where to put the turbine. In reviewing the videotape of the Board of Health meeting on September 24th of this year, 
Please note that the Director of Public Health stated at that meeting that, quote, the Board of Health was not involved in the process when the wind turbine permit applications were initially received from Situate Wind. So the Board has in fact admitted that fact as well. Notwithstanding the fact that the wind turbine is not legally permitted to be operating on the site, the fact remains that the operation of the wind turbine is a nuisance and is causing the McKeever family to be sick. Further, notwithstanding any financial implications to the town and notwithstanding any compliance issues related to the DEP, General Laws Chapter 111, Section 122 requires the Board of Health to remove or prevent any nuisance or cause of sickness within the town. So in conclusion, based on the overwhelming evidence provided to the Board of Health by the McKeevers, and their neighbors over the past three months, including the Board of Health meetings on September 24th and October 15th and today. The Board of Health is obligated by law to abate the existing nu nuisance and sickness caused by the operation of the wind turbine. On behalf of the McKeevers and the Public Health, I respectfully request that the Board of Health order Situate Wind LLC to cease and desist operations relating to the wind turbine effective immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board?
to protect because it said no trade or employment, which sell, ba 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 ba. Right. The wind turbine doesn't really have any employees that are getting sick. I mean, that's what that statute is intended to protect. Selling electricity. Selling electricity is a business. I understand, that, but it's, it's the, the, stat, the statute that, that we're talking about, and again, I think we're wasting time here because it's irrelevant at this point. Um, that that your argument is that the Board of Health should have given a permit back back before, and I understand that, and I you know I think reading well, the statute. Point is, my point is that they slipped by before, and they're trying to slip by again, and it's well, I mean, the proximate cause. I mean, you're an attorney, you know this. The yeah. proximate cause, you can see, there were no symptoms prior to the existence of the wind turbine. After the wind turbine, people are suffering. Well, a actually. The, the proximate, uh, proximate cause would require a medical expert to say that the um, health conditions are caused by whatever the substance or the product or, in this case, the, the wind turbine is. Well, then again, okay. would, you require, would you require somebody to get <coughs> doctor's notes if they had complaints about a restaurant before you shut it down? I mean, if, you are well, the board of for, health. For example, good example, if we had a case of food poisoning, um, somebody complains that they got food poisoning and that they ate at the Millwork the night before. I'm not going to shut down the Millwork based on that. One complaint. Even three complaints. Okay? What happens in, in those cases, and it's usually not us, it's usually uh, the Department of Public Health, go to, to the, the milk. First of all, they, they analyze the, the patients and find out whether it's the, the, the same strain of salmonella, which is usually what it is, and, and, and then they go to the Board of Health. I mean, they go to the restaurant and they look at the sanitary practices and they take samples, and usually they'll find the salmonella if they're somewhere, they'll find an infected employee or something like that, and then they can draw a conclusion that there is a causation between what happened and what the complaint of event is. Okay. Again, um, I, I it, and and I think you need to know that that whatever decision the board of health makes, there's going to be another side on the decision. One side's going to be happy, and the other side's going to be unhappy. The board of health's decision needs to be based on reasoned facts, evidence, and science. Okay. So I'm not, as I said, comfortable with the medical evidence that I've seen so far, especially when the letter from the doctor expressly denies, and so saying, I can't say there's an association here, I'm not gonna conclude from that that there is definitively an association. I have my thoughts on the subject, but, but you know, that's, that doesn't, that's not gonna pass muster in the Superior Court, okay, if a judge reviews this. We need to have in the record evidence Okay. That's all I'm saying. So what, what would your evidence be? You mandating a study to the effect of shadow flicker? I mean, how, how do you go about Now we're switching. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, right. an entire, that's an entirely different topic. Okay. So if I might just, so, but let, Mr. Lynch, I appreciate your comments. We're starting to go down a little bit of a slippery slope here. You don't know where I'm going. Well, I, well you don't know where I'm going, so. You've got how many folks in front of you and how many folks that aren't here that have dis publicly disclosed now personal health impacts and concerns which are directly related to the time at which this industrial wind turbine was commissioned. Both those are not to be discounted, they're not to be diminished, all right? There are a huge, and we're going to start talking about deficiencies and evidence and so on and so forth. There are a huge number of deficiencies that led up to the commissioning of this turbine, none of which fall on the shoulders of this person or anybody behind me. So we've got to be real careful how we start, what path we want to take here. So we have. All the scientific evidence on our side, by the way, from what I've seen, there's been no scientific evidence has been presented on behalf of the wind developer or Palmer Capital. So, so from my perspective as a layman, that's not in dispute at this point. In time. 
if there was reasonable, unbiased third-party scientific evidence, which even Dr. Hanning in his report points to is non-existent, that would be one thing. So I think that the Board of Health has got all the information from us, more than enough information that you probably want to have received to make an informed decision on this point. And I think that we owe it to you three, as members of that board, to have, have the time to make the decision. And, and let's reconvene tomorrow and see where we are. Actually, we make a decision to the public. So yeah. no, yeah, we should. would not be able to do this tomorrow um, because we have to publish notice of the meetings. Um, well, and I've done a lot of talking, and I, I don't want to uh, dominate the other members. <laughs> I think I led to my point where I was going with this, but I, I think we had a communication there. That when Jennifer gets back, if we can get a committee formed, I, it, to me, the, the, the most important thing is the post-construction study. And Mr. Chair, as I did indicate, yeah. I know you've got colleagues to discuss this with, and Ms. Sullivan to discuss this with, and so on, and we collectively have to have a similar conversation. So I think it probably behooves us to to break unless somebody else has got something that they would like to say. I have a question really quick. Yeah. Um, with Thompson, no relation with the Chomara. Is there, this is directed through the board, but to who did this video. Is there sound with this video? Because this is only half of it. Like, I've been to this property and there's really loud sound. And I didn't notice the flipper down there because I read it at a different time. But I would just be curious to know what the sound was yeah, I don't know at who this time. Yeah, took the video or, yeah, yeah I don't know. What, or it took it. That was a question through if you could answer. Oh, yeah, it was through, just through the board. Yeah. You have took the, the radio. Yeah, you, can hear, you can hear the turbine all the time. Yeah, I've been around at your house, but I was just running around. You can hear it all the time. It doesn't look like it. We hear it every single minute or every single day unless it's <coughs> shutting down to change wind direction or whatever it does. That's probably the best part of it was when, when the hurricane was here blowing and it was shut down. Is it any louder with that flipper? Because that flipper is pretty harsh. Um, and it wasn't that it wasn't like that when I was there, and it was pretty loud when I was there. <laughs> no, the flipper. I mean, the sound's the sound that comes out of it. it doesn't look, okay, it doesn't look the flipper okay. doesn't. Okay. Oh, yes, that, that was my question. All right. Thank you. Um, the next meeting is going to be. Um, Hold on one second. The next meeting, I believe, is November 26th. Um, I guess that's the Monday after that's in two weeks. So. Is it? That's November for sure. Yeah, yeah it's we're it's Wednesday tonight. <coughs> and, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I think that track record's pretty good for, uh, for attendance. So. Is Miss Sullivan's absence, is she going to be at that meeting as well? Well, that's the thing I'm trying to bring up, and I, I it's, that's, a, what, a week and a half, and, yeah, but uh, I'm not sure when she gets back and how much time. She's back that day, Yes. Yeah, so she's literally back that day. That's right. You folks have been communicating, obviously, yeah. in her absence, so, so I'm sure you, she'd be able to be brief. She left Saturday, I think, and she left the emails, I think, Thursday for us, Wednesday or Thursday. So there's been no communication. She's since she's been on vacation. So with me anyway. Instead of Monday, November the 26th, would it be more appropriate if she's sort of the speed bump here? Would it be more appropriate to have the meeting on Wednesday, November the 28th? I don't see a problem with it. The only issue we have is meeting room and space, and that's something we'd have to coordinate. I, I don't, I don't see a problem is, moving the date to accommodate. Not at all. And it would be better for Jennifer. Absolutely. It would make her life a lot easier with all of us. She is going to call me um, because part of her trip, she's going to Florida. She is going to call me regarding the agenda for the next meeting, so she'll be involved in, in that point that she believes that meeting is Monday. So right. I, I can find out if, you know. So if I was, Mr. Chairman, if I was to give you my card, could we have a chat tomorrow on scheduling with that? Yeah. Is, is what you're suggesting that we we postpone 
the next Board of Health meeting until a couple of days after the 26th. Correct. So that you all, can, whatever the committee is that we establish. We're, we're good for the 26th or the 28th. It seems that Ms. Sullivan's absence is creating difficulty for you folks. So if she needs a couple of days to get organized, yeah. Yeah. I think we're more than two. Well, I think we want to have a committee, and we'd like it to make sense to have a committee meet and then report to the, uh, to the Board of Health. has got to make a committee tonight. Cause who's we can't discuss anything unless we're open public. No two of us can talk out of, out of this room with an agenda, so it makes it very difficult. The only thing we can discuss is meeting time, and that's it. Can you make it Wednesday at 7? That's it. End of discussion. Um, so, well, um, can we chat tomorrow after you? Yeah, you and I can, but there's no decision I can no, make no, with these no, guys. All yeah. I'm asking yeah. for is date, and if you have a venue, and if Miss Owen's going to be here. Yeah, and I would say are, those are the three. Those are the three questions. I'm I'd almost say on the agenda for that meeting is is to figure out what we have for a committee and and what our goals are for that committee. We pretty much know what the goal is, but to set up a committee so to give. I guess one of us is going to come on that committee. Uh, Citroen LLC is going to have somebody, whether it's you, Mr. Dean, or, or, or a representative of your company, that's what we're, we're hoping. Uh, Jennifer Sullivan is the director of the Board of Health. Um, she's a non-voting member, so she can be there. Two of us can't be on that committee because then we'd have a quorum. Right. Be breaking the open meeting law. Um, then you guys will have to decide, like I said, it's going to be an odd number. And, um, if there's two or four, it, it, it doesn't bother me. And, and some of the things we've got to think about is the worst case scenarios. That's you know, oh, we're going to deal with those absolutely. Yeah. Because this can't because we can bring them on the table and, and stop. You got to have predetermined action, action items based on certain outcomes. Right. That everybody's in agreement with. So I think if, if the board's good with that, the thing it's Wednesday or maybe even the following Monday. I, I we used to meet on Mondays. So Wednesday to me is just an off day, but it doesn't matter. Whatever. Chairman. Yeah. Just, um, I'm traveling 27th, 28th, 29th. Okay. With could be the 26th, it could be the following Monday. If we did the following Monday, would, would that be, I, I'm not trying to stretch this out, believe me, it's just, it's logistics for, for a gal that's been on vacation for two weeks. And Is that the third? Would you be on the committee? Uh, I would like to be on the committee, and I'd also like to say if we have two members from the community, I'd like to tune in two members from Citroen Wind LLC to be on that committee as well. If we have two members from the community. Uh, We'll, You're always going I to would almost go number. a three and two if that's fine with you. We have to have an odd number. No, no, we don't have any, so. Well, um, if, if you get a split vote, then you're kind of yeah, sorry. You can have the, the, the committee, subcommittees, and the vote of the, 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 the residents right. will be one vote. The um, representatives of the Board of Health, which will be the director, and, and whichever one of us it is, will be another vote. Which one, when will be the third vote? We'll, we'll, we'll be able to tell you tomorrow what we're agreeable to. Okay. But I, that, that sounds pretty good to me, too, and well, I mean, I, I think, think it's an even... My thought is, is, is to make a motion tonight to appoint a committee along the lines that we've discussed tonight so that we can at least get them authorized and going, and we will let you select your representatives, and, and we'll let you select your representatives. At least that's the way I'm thinking, thinking out loud here. Yep. You can disagree if you want. And then we... we, we we charter that committee, so to speak, tonight so that they can meet on, as soon as Jennifer gets back, she'll kill me, but as soon as Jennifer gets back on the 26th, and then we'll have a meeting of the Board of Health the following Monday, um, and uh, go from there. Yeah, do that. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Mr. Lynch, uh, Jerry Kelly, 56, yes. Norman Um I feel like Carlton, your doorman from the old sitcom. Um, the, um, if I understand what you just said, you have three constituents on this committee. Right. You know, uh, the Board of Health, the developer, and the community. Right. Uh, each of the constituents will receive one vote. Right. The population of those constituents that are going on this committee, your Switzerland done so long as it's reasonable. I mean, it's obviously structured so that you know, we, we, we get a consensus. No, I understand, but you're going to get the consensus with each of the constituents having one vote. But I'm saying the population of the community constituency, so long as it's reasonable, is not limited by the one person, right? 
Right. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You guys will have to work out amongst yourselves how you want to exercise your vote. So long as it's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try to. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, if, if it ends up. That way, everything's on the table. Everybody's seen. Everybody's got. Sure. There's no. You know. If it ends up being like the House of Representatives, somebody else is, you know, and nobody can agree on anything, we'll, we'll, just, we'll have to deal with that and then go on from there. The board has the power to just go on. That's why I said earlier that sure. you know, ultimately the board will make the decision anyway. I guess I wasn't clear on my question. So I, I think that you're saying you're agnostic so that we're three, four, or five people from the community so long as we only have one vote. Right. right. Thank you. And, and I, don't, I, I also just think as a, as a matter of dynamics that I, I would hope that you would not bring four or five people to this meeting. Um, you know, probably two, two, two people. But you, you, if you want to set a subcommittee of four or five, five people of your own to sort of, sure. you know, direct that group of what they should do, I think it just makes it easier to deal with that rather than having so many people. Thank you. Yes, it's related to the committees and stuff. Um, yeah, I think so. In order to get ready for the next meeting. Sure. Okay. Um, Mr. Lynch, the name is Joanne Lett, by the way. Um, Mr. Lynch, you mentioned that there's a science that shows that there's opposition to push back on what mm. the people here. Could you, in order to get ready for the next meeting, I think it would be appropriate yeah. for you to uh, tell me what study that is so that I could take a look at it and perhaps, you know. The DPA study, I think, January of 2012, so you, as, as Mr. Darty points out, surveys. It doesn't do its own epidemiology, but it surveys um, a number of the science studies that are out there. Four. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Uh, are, are you saying that that study showed conclusively that there are not problems? There's nothing conclusive in, in this field. Okay, my only other question would be, um, when you talked about the McKeevers and their, their doctor's letter, you spoke like a true lawyer. And, and I guess what I mean by that is you're saying the doctor made sure to point out there was no conclusive proof. But it seems like things are a little upside down and inside out. Why is it not the McKeevers who are receiving the Board of Health support by sh shutting down the turbine until the wind developer is the one that proves conclusively that there's not a problem? You're saying the McKeevers, who you had to watch that video and listen to their testimony many times and read all their, I I'm finding a little disconnect with the fact that you're not supporting your resident you're erring on the side of the turbine I, developer. I, I'll, I'll repeat what I said to okay. Mr. Thompson. Do you see that why is, That is, don't assume you think you know what I'm thinking. <laughs> okay, now that's why I asked the question. Uh, I heard a disconnect there. But what, what I'm saying to you all, though, is, and I, I, I think most of you heard it, is that the Board of Health has an obligation to make decisions based on evidence and facts and the record is going to need to support the decision that the Board of Health makes in case anybody wants to go to the Superior Court and challenge the decision. I don't want to go through this whole process and then have some judge in a year, I, you know, I'm a lawyer and I'm in the Superior Court all the time, have some judge in a year tell us that um, there was insufficient evidence uh, to support the Board's decision and we're going to send it back and start all over again. Mr. Okay. Lynch. So, so what I, I'm not, I'm just making the comment here about what I, what evidence it is I think that we need and what, what I wish, I wish I had more, frankly. Um, but don't read into that necessarily how you think, I think, okay? Mr. Lynch, how about if we all sign affidavits? How's that for evidence? Hey, the, I, the law is not track. Well, well, you'll have affidavits on record. Yeah, no, I'll get not track. I, I, well, Mr. Lynch is the one that said he needs evidence and witnesses. You got several of them. We're off track. I'd, I'd rather just, mm -hmm. I think we'll make a good flow of progress here, and I'd rather stay on that track. I can take them. I'm a justice of the peace. I can get them tonight. We're all set, Mr. Dodd. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask one last question, Mr. Chairman? One second. In the, in the back, please. Pardon me, keep on question it, as to far as if this is one of many videos that I've taken so if the board isn't willing to take that as evidence today I'm asking Mr. Dean can you shut up the turbine during those hours so my kids can do their homework 
because later on that night, they're certainly not going to sleep. So give them one or the other. I don't think the board needs to make that decision. I think you, as a man, can make that decision, owner of the wind turbine. You can shut down that during the flicker when it's at my house. I think you have the power to do that. I don't think you need the board to tell you to do that. I think you, as the owner of the turbine, can do that. Thank you. Um, so for the record, we've got another two week period, three weeks, whatever yeah, it's right. going to be. What is the official Board of Health's position in terms of turning this thing off now well, yeah. until such time as all of this gets sorted out because this community group continues to be impacted for the next three, four weeks and God knows how long it's going to take to go on. So. Uh, again, I don't want to. I think the board needs to have a discussion right now about this because we keep asking questions. But I have two motions in mind, but I don't want to jump the gun here because I've been dominating conversation a little bit too much. And I don't want to do that. So you guys need to construct your point of view. So go right ahead. As I said, I'm, I'm post construction, post construction study, and that's where I'm at before I make any decision. So, so then the answer is, is that that turbine continues to operate during the central period. Yes. That's the board health's decision. No, that's my decision. Yeah. Right now, I go post construction. You're one of three members. I'm asking, what's the board of health's position tonight yep. on turning this thing off until as we go through this next phase? I have two motions. That could be permitted to make my motion. I. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I can discuss it. Yeah. But I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to cut off everybody. No, <laughs> no, please shoot the yeah. Okay. Well, the easy one first. Um, move that the Board of Health appoint a steering committee uh, to advise the Board of Health that its next regularly noticed meeting as to um, the retention of a uh, contractor to conduct a wind study on the noise effects of the situate wind turbine on the community and whether the turbine is in compliance with its permit and all applicable state and local regulations. That the committee be composed of uh, basically uh, of three voting uh, groups, one group being um, composed of the, the uh, representatives, two representatives of the uh, affected community, that the other group be composed of two representatives from Situate Wind LLC, and that the third group be uh, one member of the Board of Health, and the director of health for the town of Situate. And that each group will have one vote um, in terms of making a recommendation to the Board of Health. That's next meeting. I think I said that already. Good of you, I think. only add that when you said regulations, the noise regulations. The only thing I would say is that we've got to make a decision of which one of us is going to That'll I'll take it out of the motion. But why don't we appoint the committee first and then we can decide which one of the three of us. That's my motion. That's the yes, motion on the table. Can you second that? Can you second that motion? All those in favor? Well, we should have a discussion. Yeah. Mind, but I don't think, hopefully we won't have any. Okay. I, I didn't want to jump the gun, Mr. Lynch. Is your second motion addressing shadow flicker? No. no wait, what, what is the time here? <laughs> we're going to vote on, we're going to, first of all, I think procedurally, you need to give people an opportunity to comment for the board to put board to comment on the discussed motion. I think we've discussed it. I, I, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> is there any comment on that? Yes. Yeah. May I please ask that the board, my name is Jerry Kelly, I'm at 56 William Road. Um, may I please request that, uh, that the group be charged with not only conducting uh, a, a search, uh, a study of the propriety of commissioning an acoustic study 
but also a shepherd soldier style. Because the, <laughs> they're both issues. Yes, yeah, okay. Uh, that was my, that was my okay. comment, too. Sure, sure, sure. I was thinking of the funding question, but we can address that. But that's a good point. So I, I would add or amend my motion to include uh, Shadow and Flicker as well. And, 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 and with the idea being that the committee will probably have to recognize that Situation may not participate in the funding of that, and um, we'll need to figure out how we're going to do that. You can always get creative with the we set the time. I, I think I'm comfortable with them together. I, I think the committee it, it keeps it gel. Um, you second the. Uh, any other discussion on that? Yeah, I'm making a motion to do a steering committee to conduct a study, <coughs> but you're not saying whether the results of that study are going to be taken as, 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 as the result of the, another, it's binding. In other words, if the study finds that there's a violation, does that mean it's binding, you're going to shut it down, or are you still going to take this under commitment under, under uh, advisement again? Then no, I think you've got to go one step at a time, but I, I think I've made my point clear that if, if there is a study done, it's pretty black and white. It either falls within the guidelines or it doesn't. If it doesn't fall within the guidelines, then that's it. I think the agreement in principle yeah. is that this whole process, we'll call it an RFP process for lack of a better term, and, and the development of this from the committee will not only include a scope of work in identifying who the right candidates are for this and award that, but also there'll be agreement with, as we walk out as to what the action items will be based on certain outcomes. So I think that, that the committee gave will be charged with handling all of that if I understand your approach correctly. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, I don't want you to come and say, they say, oh, it's not in compliance. Well, we we, we not, unhappy let's, with let's that. Not what you happened. can't you yeah. can't get there, David. What we need to do is do the business requirements document, the scope of work, do the study, and then the committee needs to look at the results of the study and make a decision. You can't you can't say if then at this point because we don't know what we've decided. Okay, so motions on the board on I'm the an table. Engineer, no, <laughs> numbers and second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That's unanimous. Now what we need to decide which one of us is going to be on that committee. I'm not volunteering. <laughs> Can we that? Um, was it? <laughs> I, uh, at, at this point, I'm busy with another month of the time. But, uh, Tell me what you want to know. You don't want to really want to get you want to get on the stage one. You can get up and read this. Why don't you sleep on it? You have to do this in public form. You sound like Dwight D. Eisenhower. If nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, like I say, this month here, I'm very busy this month. After that, I got two months of some free time. But if you're going to have to step up to the plate, you know. Okay. Do we uh, uh, need to uh, move that Mr. Vaz be appointed the representative of the Board of Health to the uh, second that, all those in favor. Aye. Aye. Um, Can I make a statement before we close? We're not closing yet. Oh. Yeah. Um, Janelle, uh, there was a. I have another motion. Another motion. Um, uh, Mr. Dean, is there a way to? program the turbine so that um, it can be turned off when uh, it's operating, when the wind is coming from a particular direction. I don't have the answer to that question. Sorry. 
done. Okay. It's in the study. Yes. Yeah? It's in the study? Yeah. All right. Well, maybe. Uh, is, uh, I know we asked about 11 to 7, uh, but my motion is <coughs> uh, pending the results of the study that the wind turbine be turned off from 10 p.m. until 7 a.m. when the wind is blowing from the northwest to the southwest, which would allow it to be on from northeast, the other the other side. No, the wind's going from the southwest to the northeast. You want southwest to northeast. northeast. Right, right, right. Yeah. Southwest to northeast. Um, until the results of the study uh, are published to uh, the Situate Board of Health at a public hearing. And if the, um, <coughs> if the turbine is uh, not capable of being turned off or programmed to be turned off in the wind, um, based, based on wind direction, then, then that would be turned off from, from 10 p.m. at all. What did I say? 7 a.m. 7, I'm sorry, I, I meant 6. So 10, 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. That's a motion. That's my motion. Is there a second? What would be the time frame on the study? <coughs> until the study is completed. Until the study is published <coughs> and announced that at a public hearing before the Board of Health, at which point the idea being the idea being two things. One, the Board of Health could then look at it and take some action if, if need be. And two, this provides some incentive to get the study done. And, uh, any other? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, may I come in? Uh, yes, it provides an incentive for us to get the study done. It does not provide an incentive for the community to get the study done. Understood. Um, also, it would be impossible to actually conduct the study under those conditions because you want to be testing the turbine at night when it's operating that's the quietest time that's a good point. when you get the biggest turbine. Well that goes without saying. That's that's you have to turn it on for testing when it's being tested. Yeah but you, it, it, presumably you wouldn't need to be running it all that long. Yeah. Right? That's a good point. Mr. Lynch, yes. could we amend your um, motion to state uh, that will occur until we begin the study. Okay. Fair enough. And upon commencing the, the testing component of the study, and then once the testing component of the study is completed, there's going to be a bit of a time for it to be drafted and released and so on. So so I think I think the intent of what you're saying is you're please correct me if I'm wrong, is, is that we agree that this right. will need to operate during the evening yeah. while the actual test is so going I'm adding to my motion, except as necessary in order for a period of time necessary in order to conduct the testing uh, as ordered by the uh, Board of Health. Mr. Lynch and Jerry Jones. Uh, uh, to support Mr. Dean's position, it has to be operating to do the testing, and the testing cannot be done the way it was last time over three and a half calendar days. You need to have a valid sample of time for this testing to occur. And we expect the committee will advise yeah. us also. Yeah. So I think it will be operating more than we would like in the neighborhood, but it has to be operating to have a valid study result. Understood. Yes, a question from everyone, 27 Gilson Road. Could you just go over the wind direction again for me? Because the way it sounded to me, that's the wind that affects me, coming from the southwest to the northeast. He basically said it's going to be shut down given a certain wind direction. Yeah. This explains to me exactly how it works. It sounded to me like that's the wind that maybe but, you know. They're that. saying shutting it down with the wind that bothers us. Right. Okay. Is that, so, is that so when the wind is yeah. coming across so that it's blowing across towards third cliff. Correct. So it's yes. that, that, okay. yeah. that'll, give, that'll give relief for third cliff all the way out to Moreland and up the part okay, no, of Well, it, it doesn't. Uh, if you take a look at that wind rose. Sure. That's why I, I wanted to be clear about that. If you take a look at that wind rose, yeah. <coughs> two-thirds of the time, 
the wind is operating from the southwest to the northwest. So it's coming out of the southwest, west, northwest to the northeast, east, southeast. So that's what that windrose is telling you there from those studies. So, you know, when somebody who lives at 56 Moreland Road will be impacted by a northwest by a northwest wind heading to the southeast, which becomes the pre our prevailing wind during the winter. Uh, during the summer, the prevailing is southwest. And believe me, my oh, so I, I don't plan on being having this discussion in the summer. So the northwest is really I, an issue well, here. It, it's really, if you look at your wind roads, yeah. wind roads, it comes from the northwest, west, southwest. That's the, the those are the wind, the, those are the offensive winds. Right. Isn't that what I said? Northwest and southwest. Yes. Yeah. Coming from, yeah, coming from, coming the, from the north. southwest, west, northwest, anywhere in that spectrum, blowing to its counterpart in the east. So which is the wind coming from the southwest, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Southwest, yeah. Coming west, from the northwest. southwest to the northwest. No. Northwest. Coming from the southwest to the northeast. Right. During the winter, it's from the northwest to the southeast. Right. right. So, you know, this way. <coughs> it's, a, it's a pie. Yeah, but those, but those winds there. in the winter don't bother us as much. You still get some from the southwest. And, and but they, the they bother the residents of 56 more than Road. Right. So, uh, so I, are we we're good with northwest? I, I just don't understand why we're, we're talking about wind direction. Yeah, so right, it should be a total right. time because yeah. you're basically getting a subset of, of where people live. Well, so let me just say this. I don't want to go debate this too much yeah. longer because I think I'm standing alone on this issue. So, um, but the motion's been made. <laughs> Any other uh, question on the motion? Holidays, yeah. Well, I think I think that 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 that's a good neutral trade-off because this time of year, most of the wind blows from the direction that you're saying to keep the turbine up, and that'll give uh, the turbine going up still a lot of income from it, and it'll give us relief when those times that it goes off. So it's a it's a good it's a good trade-off. If you won't shut it down entirely, yeah. Can I just make a note that we doesn't matter which way it goes. I am. I am. Okay, I just want to make that. I'm doing the best I can. No, I appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, Christine. I, I just need to comment on this. But Mr. Thompson said on the record that uh, the only studies that have been submitted are uh, studies from their side indicating there are health effects. Um, we did submit. Uh, the Department of Public Health, Massachusetts Department of Public Health study referenced other studies. We're happy to provide copies of those. Uh, with respect to Dr. Nessenbaum, study that was submitted earlier today, Dr. Nessenbaum has been a long-term opponent of wind uh, turbines, uh, whose testimony has been thrown out in court because he's unqualified, he's a radiologist. Um, so I caution the board to take action uh, based upon uh, the uh, opponent's studies that have been submitted. I believe Dr. Nessenbaum was one of three qualified individuals uh, in that peer review report, Mr. Dean. So, thanks for the comment. There are many people throughout history who quote the quote, quote as being wrong and then they're proven right, like Christopher Columbus, Albert Einstein. You know, so maybe Nessenbaum is just saying wrong, but he's really right. You know. Well, this, these conditions were discussed 
um, during the permitting process. Agreements were reached during the permitting process. Um, we believe we're operating in accordance with the permits that were given to us. We're happy to work with the town to discuss study noise and, and flicker, but it's our belief that we're operating in accordance with our permit conditions. That's not a solution to my children trying to study. Would you comfortably coexist with that? Two hours every yeah. single day? Um, all those in favor, aye. Needless journey. Thank you.